Hey guys, today we're going to be reading my book, Fake Diseases. Chapter 1. What is disease? I think the word disease is misleading. Even when taken literally, as a lack of ease or a lack of health, it doesn't seem to help us much to think about health problems in terms of disease. Disease. Noun. Early 14th century. Discomfort, inconvenience, distress, trouble. From Old French, disease. Lack, want, discomfort, distress, trouble, misfortune, disease, sickness. From des, meaning without or away. The root of the word doesn't seem to help us. Likely, if you are experiencing a health problem, you already understand that it is troubling. It doesn't much help to have a doctor give you a Latin name for it, especially if the only treatments involved are some kind of pharmaceutical drug, surgery, or test. As alternative practitioners, we are in a tricky situation. In most cases, we're not legally allowed to treat any diseases. Strictly, in most cases, we're not legally allowed to treat people. We are allowed to support and promote the maintenance and repair of a healthy body. It's not as jazzy as talking about diseases and cures, but most curiously in this language, we learn that medical doctors themselves hardly talk of cures at all either. There are runs and walks for the cures, all types of fundraisers that use the word of a disease next to the word cure, but you won't find many medical professionals willing to use the word. Once, I boarded a tightly packed caravan from California to Mexico. We were on our way to a seminar that I was to co-host. I shook the hand of the man next to me, and I asked what he does. He responded enthusiastically, I cure people of chronic diseases. His response illustrates perfectly why so many people are willing to travel to so-called lesser countries for medical tourism. They can at least get real answers. It seems most people really don't know that a medical doctor is not trained in curing diseases. They are trained in treating diseases. Managing is the current word. Many are also trained in a specialty, such as surgery, anesthesiology, pathology, etc. But it is all under the disease management umbrella with the exception of infectious diseases, which I will cover as well. The language defines the practice. As alternative practitioners, it is lucky for us that we are not allowed to treat diseases, because that's not really what we want to do. And we don't treat people for problems. We don't support problems. We support and promote the maintenance and repair of a healthy body. A healthy body does not have a disease. A healthy body does not have a discomfort, a trouble, physical at least, or a physical inconvenience. Still not very jazzy. A lot of our work in dealing with people out in the wild is rewiring how they think about disease. Daily, we are asked direct questions in the form of, can I cure this disease? Legally, I cannot answer this properly, but in this book I have attempted to deal with each category of disease in simple language we can all understand. I called this book fake diseases because this tangling of words is more than just not helpful. It has trapped us in a system of medical thought and medical practice that makes it much less likely that you will reach ease or health. In the worst cases, the medical response to a disease can harm or kill a patient. Much of this is brushed off as an order of business. But in the alternative world, by aiming to support and promote maintenance and repair, then we are giving the body the ability to heal itself. That last point there, heal thyself, is truly an obscure term these days. In this year of 2021, surely all future readers know of the recent hysteria. Surely the words heal thyself were nowhere in the worldwide discussion. This actually leads us to the premise and the difference between schools of medicine. Any field or school will fall into two categories, holistic or allopathic. Holistic is sometimes spelled with a W, holistic, and allopathic is sometimes called Western medicine, conventional medicine, or orthodox medicine. This is a definition from Healthline.com. They say it can also be called biomedicine or even mainstream medicine. The words really are informative, but if you didn't know the difference between holistic and allopathic, you'd think there is only one option for treatment. Allopathic medical doctors are really the only profession in the mainstream camp. Osteopaths are sometimes called allopathic and sometimes they prefer to identify as holistic. The only real difference between the schools is the premise. The body can maintain and repair itself, or it is just waiting to break and in need of pharmaceutical or surgical intervention. The allopathic school thinks that disease is a natural consequence of being alive, and that drugs or surgery are the best ways to manage this. The holistic schools, which is everyone else in the healing world, 
think that the body can build, maintain, and repair its own tissues. And it is our job to provide the raw nutritional material and keep our internal environment free of the things that get in the way. Of course the only option for treatment of disease is from the only school of medicine legally qualified to treat a disease. But we're not taught about the option of supporting the body's ability to heal itself. The mainstream medical world talks nothing of the body's ability to heal itself. Here's more from Healthline.com. Allopathic medicine is also called allopathy. It's a health system in which medical doctors, nurses, pharmacists, and other healthcare professionals are licensed to practice and treat symptoms and diseases. Treatment is done with medication, surgery, radiation, other therapies and procedures. On the other side of the fence are the fields that believe that the body can heal itself, given the right ingredients and environment. The body grew itself, all by itself. The body can produce all of its own hormones, neurotransmitters, enzymes, it produces its own stem cells, it can regulate its own temperature, organs, blood levels, and so on. The holistic side of the fence believes that all pharmaceutical interventions are harmful, even when some may be entirely necessary, particularly in the case of infections. But even in emergencies, we do not believe that drugs are a cure unless the disease was caused directly by an infection, which is killed by a drug and thus cured. Gratefully, doctors don't talk much about cures, so there is not much argument about the actual reversal of disease. They manage diseases. It's quite literally not their job to cure them. When we aim to restore health and eliminate all signs of a disease, we are therefore not competing with doctors, as their aim is to manage the symptoms, not eliminate them. We would prefer our customers not to have diseases or symptoms or concerns. We would prefer to help them get out of pain, but it is not us doing the work. It is with basic, mostly forgotten, often forbidden nutritional strategies that are as old as humanity. The only thing truly preventing the average person from attaining good health is the barrier to information in the medical marketplace. The language around disease dictates the way we respond to disease. The monopoly in this marketplace is held by a profession that does not believe the body can heal itself. Due to this monopoly in the public image of healthcare, the average person simply does not know about the other options. These paragraphs serve as the disclaimer that we are not really arguing the necessity of some of the most common medical interventions. Some surgeries are necessary, many are not. Antibiotics save lives, and they are also overprescribed and can cause serious long-term damage to those patients. Some tests could be useful, but in practice, we don't really need tests. We don't need to see blood work, and in fact, most people who come to us with diseases tell us that their blood is fine, according to their doctors. They come to us with health problems and previous diagnosis of disease, but their blood is fine. So the charts don't help us that much anyways. These days, we don't even see our customers in real life in most cases. We don't need to touch them or take their temperature. We just need to give them advice that actually works. Chapter 2. Birth Defects Let's start with the easy diseases. We are told that birth defects are diseases. But in our holistic understanding, all birth defects are environmental. Something was missing in the development process, or something harmful damaged the process. Which part of this is a lack of ease? This is a mechanical issue. Someone steps away from the assembly line, and a part does not make it onto the car. The medical profession that is responsible for birthing children in the developed world are allopathic medical doctors. It is worth mentioning that nutrition is not a required course in allopathy. Mainstream medicine seems to believe that nutrition is overrated, or at least, that we can get everything we need by eating all the food groups. We have a lengthy explanation as to why it is not true that we can get everything we need by eating all the food groups, but it is simpler to talk about animals as a starting point. Thankfully, it is not a legal issue to talk about preventing birth defects in animals. It is standard business to maintain flocks, herds, or colonies of animals without birth defects. Notice that the word cure here is not relevant. Part of my reason for calling these diseases fake is not that they don't occur. Birth defects are real, they do occur. But that this language doesn't make sense. You don't catch a birth defect. The cause is multidimensional, as are most of the topics we will cover. But even if the cause is understood, in the case of birth defects, there is no cure. So how can we run for a cure if the only option in birth defects is to prevent them or deal with them? You can see how this thinking of diseases and cures is entirely misleading by glancing at a list of only a few birth defects. Type 1 Diabetes End Note 1 
My understanding of pathology and pathogenesis of disease comes mostly from Dr. Joel Wallach. I don't mean this book to be academic, so I'm not going to give citations for every disease. I encourage referencing Dr. Wallach's work for specific technical explanations about diseases. Return to text. Down syndrome, heart defects, cystic fibrosis, cleft lips, cleft palate, hernias, limb defects, sickle cell anemia, thalassemia. End note 2. Thalassemia and sickle cell are the same thing under the microscope. Sickle cell is the name they give it when it appears in black people, thalassemia in white people. I assume this is because they believe the disease is genetically transmitted. We believe it is a birth defect, completely preventable like all other birth defects. And people with these problems can live a relatively healthy, long life by following healthy lifestyle practices. Return to text. Each of these are understood and prevented in every animal in domestic care. In humans, most of these are thought of as unique to humans and transmitted through genetics. Usually they have different names in animals than in humans. Farmers don't need to know most of the names because they will probably never have to deal with them simply by following regular nutritional protocols by the book. For example, muscular dystrophy in humans is referred to as a disease, a disease in need of a cure. Medicalnewstoday.com said in 2020 that the average life expectancy of a muscular dystrophy patient nowadays is 26. They say plainly, there is no cure. Fundraising efforts have continued for decades. New treatments are actively being tested, they say. In animals, this problem is known as white muscle disease. It is caused by a selenium deficiency. This is taught to farmers. Selenium is usually given by injection into pregnant livestock. Feeds are regularly fortified with selenium and its cofactors, particularly iodine. Most of the topsoil on earth is barren of selenium. I am neither a farmer nor a veterinarian. This is common knowledge across the world. For some reason we believe all animals have similar pathogenesis, development of disease, and we give common disease names across the animal kingdom. So, in every other large animal you can name, muscular dystrophy is called white muscle disease and is prevented with the same protocol. With humans, it is a different name, and so we can be forgiven for missing the connection. Alas, we are animals. Our nutritional requirements are roughly the same as every other animal, and we all get the same diseases from the same nutritional deficiencies, however we choose to name it. It could be a very long list, but suffice to say, we, meaning humanity, have cured all of these birth defect problems in animals by prevention. Animal husbandry is as old as society, as far as we know. All industries involving animals have eliminated all birth defects. All animals, all birth defects. It also has nothing to do with inbreeding. It is standard practice to inbreed practically every animal you can think of without a problem. In most cases of domestic breeds, particularly in the pet industry, inbreeding has occurred for dozens of generations. No birth defects except in the case of born runts or stillborns. Healthy animals often have large litters or many eggs, it is not necessarily a sign of a problem with the mother to have a runt or two. The rest of her babies should be in perfect condition. Perfect is a word you don't see too often in medical reference to a human. But in the animal industries, perfect means normal. It is perfectly normal to have a healthy litter from a healthy mother and have a runt or a stillborn in the batch, or an egg with nothing in it. It happens. Goats commonly have twins, and every farmer knows that one just might not make it. One is stronger from the start. In the wild, one has a real chance. Often the mother abandons the runt. Sometimes it's not even a clear runt. It is very common to have one of the twins rejected, especially in young mothers. Farmers are used to bottle feeding the rejects. Sometimes the mother kills it on purpose. Infanticide saves important resources in the wild. Runts are not always birth defects. The mothers can be prize-winning animals that achieve their proper longevity and never experience illness or infection. Inbred for generations. Given the proper nutritional environment, generational perfection is basically guaranteed. Anyone can learn to be a farmer and do this. Western medicine does not apply this to humans. My mentor, Dr. Joel Wallach, has sued the FDA multiple times successfully, often in reference to birth defects and essential nutrients. As a veterinarian before becoming a licensed medical practitioner on humans, he knew that much human suffering was already eliminated in animals long ago, especially birth defects. That's an animal husbandry 101 he and others have secured several qualified health claims from the FDA and mandates to include these nutrients in prenatal formulas and baby foods. 
In the case of many birth defects, if the nutrient was not present near the beginning of the pregnancy, the birth defect has already occurred. It is these early mistakes that can lead to larger problems in development. So nutritional deficiencies early in pregnancy are not addressed by taking prenatal formulas or baby foods. The nutrients needed to be present before the woman would have had a chance to know they are pregnant. Most women don't start taking prenatal formulas until they've missed two periods. That is too late for much of the list of birth defects to be rectified. So, birth defects cannot be cured because they have already happened. The glass is broken. The leg isn't there. The mouth isn't big enough to fit all of the teeth. The gland isn't equipped to do its job. The brain is underdeveloped. Whatever it is. Calling a birth defect a disease completely misses the cause of the problem. The medical profession has no explanation for the cause of much of the list above. I don't mean that they have an explanation that we disagree with. There's lots of those. I mean they honestly don't know. The name of the disease has not helped us, and calling it a disease has not helped us. When something is labeled a disease, it falls under the jurisdiction of the allopathic medical profession. This profession has no clear understanding of the cause, prevention, or cure of this category. They do not claim to. No birth defect will ever be cured. The language doesn't even make sense. Recently, sudden infant death syndrome has decreased dramatically in America. This decline coincides with the FDA mandate, secured in part by Dr. Wallach, to include selenium in baby formulas. Part of the work used to secure the claim is the connection between selenium deficiency and sudden infant death syndrome. End note 3. USA Federal Register, Volume 78, Number 73, Tuesday, April 16th, 2013. When this was announced in various state and national newspapers, most of them didn't use the word cure, to my knowledge. They didn't know why, but the occurrence of sudden infant death syndrome was just disappearing. We'd like to see more diseases disappear. They will disappear long before they are called cured by the allopathic medical world. Even when an individual patient has been in remission from a disease for decades, the patient is not declared cured. Really, we don't even have a framework to begin saying anything has been cured. We can eliminate symptoms, they can vanish, people can change their lifestyles, they can consume more nutrients, they can appear by all measures to be perfectly healthy after being diagnosed with a disease, but they can never legally be declared cured. You would think that cure and eliminated are the same thing. Apparently not. Selenium is just one of the essential minerals. Minerals are the largest category of essential nutrients. They're arguably the most important category because all of the degenerative diseases are mineral deficiency diseases. End note 4. Vitamin and omega deficiencies are also common and can cause misery. Plants can make vitamins, amino acids, essential fatty acids, which are omegas, antioxidants, and all kinds of medicinal compounds, but they can't make minerals. Return to text. In our belief, there are at least 59 other essential minerals and 30 other distinct nutrients that are essential to the proper structure and function of our body. We need them to develop properly, to function properly, and to repair ourselves. If certain nutrients are missing during development, a specific birth defect will be present. If many are missing, the child can be born with several diseases, or the pregnancy is miscarried. If those same nutrients are missing later in life, a disease is the result. Essential nutrients are called essential because without them, we get a disease. Medical doctors recognize this, by the way. They just have a shorter list of essential nutrients. They believe you need less of them than we believe, and they think you can get these nutrients by eating all the food groups. Medical doctors also recognize several birth defects as nutrient deficiencies, especially as more and more such claims are filed against the FDA but their only advice is to use prenatal formulas once a woman is pregnant. Again, this is too late to prevent much of the list. As far as I can tell, the only reason the medical profession is able to convey the idea that these diseases are in fact diseases at all is their theory that many of these diseases are transmitted genetically. I have said that part of my problem in calling something a disease is the implication that you can catch it. In reality, most disease is a name for a collection of symptoms. The reason there are so many disease names is that there are so many different symptoms and an even larger number of potential combinations of symptoms. If a person has all the signs of a disease but also has other symptoms, often it is named a new disease. This adds to the confusion. So, by the logic of the medical profession, relying on the theory that birth defects are transmitted genetically, they are able to call it a disease and call for a cure, and research money.
and pharmaceutical intervention. Well, in animals, none of this is considered genetic. If an animal is born with a defect, it is considered the fault of the farmer or zookeeper or pet shop owner. If your snakes are born with crooked spines, it is your fault. If they can't make it out of the egg because their egg tooth hasn't developed, it is your fault for failing to provide them enough minerals to do so. It was not transmitted from mother to baby. It was a problem on the conveyor belt. Except in humans, apparently. In all this talk of fake or mislabeled or misleading diseases, you will find no evidence of any disease that is genetically transmitted. Every disease we can name, we have the corresponding disease in animals already mapped out, and we have eliminated every single one of them in standard practice. It is only by tragic ignorance or misunderstanding that we treat ourselves and the way we think about our own diseases differently from animals. Most of us never get a chance to stop and wonder why we are the only species that can get a disease via genetics. Chapter 3. Sexually Transmitted Diseases When I was a kid, people came by our school and gave us a seminar about sexually transmitted diseases. We were told that sex could lead to disease. Scary. I will deal with AIDS separately later in the book, but for the rest of the STDs, they were unceremoniously renamed sexually transmitted infections. They just changed the letter. Renaming is common, but this one is appreciated. Many adults today still give me a puzzled look when I tell them there are no sexually transmitted diseases. An infection is not a disease in the sense of most of what we think of as diseases. An infection is different from osteoporosis or diabetes or cancer. The only reason we call all of these things diseases is so they can legally be treated by the allopathic profession. One of my problems with calling so many things diseases is the common definition is lost. An infection and a birth defect are wildly different things. The body falling apart is different from catching a virus. Giving birth is much different than saving an accident victim. But these are all spoken of together in one bundle primarily because one profession has claimed responsibility for the whole lot. How are we to know the difference between important types of health problems if we call them all the same thing? What if we called all the colors blue? Hey, could you hand me the blue? No, the other blue. Would you bring your car to a guy who spent most of his time fixing pianos and refurbishing old furniture? It's all the same thing, right? We can catch an infection, and we can also legally cure an infection. Syphilis is cured with penicillin. This is legal language. It is the correct terminology. Notice that the word cure is entirely appropriate in this situation. A bug is killed by penicillin. The problem has a direct observable cause. And once the bug is killed, the problem is completely eliminated. It will not reoccur unless re-exposed. A cancer patient without symptoms is forever in remission, but if you had a sexually transmitted infection, it was cured by an antibiotic. All of the sexually transmitted infections are indeed infections, which is why it is good that they renamed them. Unfortunately, the overall language of disease still obfuscates the truth. Through the control of language, the treatment is also controlled. I believe that one of the many reasons sexually transmitted infections are promoted so heavily is that they are one of the only things that give medical doctors their ability to claim that they are the only legitimate practitioners of medicine. We cured syphilis. Trust us with everything else. The branch of pharmaceuticals known as antibiotics have their purpose defined in the name. They kill biotics. A biological agent infects a body, and we know a corresponding chemical that neutralizes that bug in many cases. These infections are not as common as you would think. I hardly ever come across anyone claiming to have a sexually transmitted infection. We are almost never asked about it. The younger generations today do not seem worried about it. My parents' generation wasn't really worried about them in the first place. My age group was given the full scare treatment as kids, but the hype has largely died down about it. More unfortunately, the medical profession over time has used their successes in curing infection as justification for pursuing pharmaceutical intervention in other non-infectious diseases. This is how we get disease management with pharmaceutical drugs, and it was never justified. Infections are not diseases. Antibiotic treatment is not long-term, and success is measurable and observable. This does not apply to any other diseases on our list. The one category that mainstream medicine can cure are not even called diseases anymore. It is worth mentioning that syphilis was officially cured in 1943, 
Aside from infection, there has not been a single disease cured by drugs, surgery, or any other mainstream Western treatment. We can catch infections via sex. We can also catch an infection by scraping our knee on the pavement or by improper tattoo aftercare. But these are not diseases. Your mother doesn't tell you to clean out your cut or you'll get a disease. Antibacterial soap comes in many forms. We would recommend using natural soaps that you can understand the ingredients of. But even a cheap chemical antibacterial soap will prevent most wounds from becoming infected. The potential for an infection is always present. All a person has to do to decrease their chances of getting an infection is to keep their wounds clean. I like to use colloidal silver on wounds or fresh tattoos after washing with antibacterial soap. Internal infections, I believe, are very similar. I have no evidence that sexually transmitted infections are different from wound infections, in the sense that it doesn't matter where on earth you are, if you fail to keep your wounds clean, they will become infected. Our world is awash with bacteria and viruses and microorganisms of endless variety. It is commonly said that around 90% of our body cells are bacteria. I believe the potential for internal infection is the same as external infection. If we fail to keep our internal environment clean, we provide the environment for bad bacteria to thrive. Here I am talking about the internal environment of the digestive system. We will cover this in more detail later, as it applies to many common infections such as ear, sinus, and urinary tract, as well as a proclivity to fungal infections and more. But the other internal environment, in the case of sexually transmitted infections, is the cavities of the sex organs themselves. It is no wonder that sexually transmitted infections are more common in women than men. More dark, damp space for bacteria to thrive if it is not washed thoroughly, especially after sex. I believe that a majority of the cases I have seen could have been prevented by just showering after sex, instead of falling asleep. If a tattoo is infected, it could have been prevented with hygiene. This does not mean if you ever got a sexually transmitted infection that you are unhygienic. A person can be perfectly clean all day, get their orifices dirty, fall asleep, and wake up with an infection. This is not proven, but it is my observation with my handful of cases that each person I have seen experiencing a sexually transmitted infection has other symptoms of an internal digestive environment that is off. I just have not seen an otherwise perfectly healthy person with a sexually transmitted infection. In my theory, a person can still have a one-off, unclean night and have themselves a problem, even if they eat well. Some people call this terrain theory. This implies that the infection is not out there trying to get us. The theory is that we were always in a sea of bacteria and viruses. We do not seem to have a problem with them as long as our body is healthy and clean. In any case, if any of us catches a sexually transmitted infection, there is an antibiotic ready for us. There are also many natural herbal alternatives. Sexually transmitted infections often aren't that serious, and many people can rid themselves of symptoms simply by drinking cranberry extract or taking a common antimicrobial tincture such as oil of oregano or olive leaf extract. Chapter 4. Bone and Joint Diseases This is one of the largest categories of disease. There are currently over 200 diseases listed in the physician's desk reference with the same nutritional deficiency root, or connection. Many of these are the bone and joint diseases, but it is worth seeing a short list of the types of problems in this category. Spondylitis, arthritis, back pain, Bell's palsy, bone fractures, bone spurs, brittle fingernails, calcium deposits, cartilage damage, cognitive impairment, delusions, depression, dowager's hump, elevated blood calcium, eczema, high and low blood pressure, hyperactivity, hyperparathyroidism, insomnia, irritability, joint pain, kidney stones, limb numbness, muscle cramps, nervousness, neuromuscular excitability, osteofibrosis, osteomalacia, osteoporosis, palpitations, panic attacks, paresthesia, periodontal disease, pica, which in humans we call the munchies, prolonged clotting time, receding gums, restless legs, retarded growth, rickets, sciatica, spasms and twitches, spinal stenosis, tetany, tinnitus, tooth decay, vertigo. Not a fun list. Many of these problems have other nutrient deficiencies involved. These really are true diseases in the sense of a lack of health. None of these are caught and cured like the infectious diseases. There is one exception we will get to. And like birth defects, the mainstream medical world has no official idea what causes, prevents, or cures any of them. 
There is more than one reason I called this book fake diseases. This category of disease is very real, very unpleasant, and very expensive. But this group of problems was cured a thousand years ago in Chinese agricultural history. It was rediscovered in Europe centuries ago as well, and in the 20th century it was biochemically mapped the modern way and addressed nutritionally with complete success. We figured it out in animals. It just has not been applied to humans by the allopathic profession, so we didn't hear much about it. You might have noticed that the only medical professionals you have probably ever seen on television, film, or the media were allopathic doctors, nurses, pharmacists, and scientists. There are no dramas about the holistic world that I know of. We are subliminally educated to see disease in the allopathic view partially because it is the only one we are exposed to in our modern lives. Sometimes we hear of the quacks with the dark glass bottles of snake oil. Not many people are persuaded to look into holistic protocols with this type of a widespread mainstream opinion about them. Likely the witty protagonist doctor on the TV, between heroically saving lives, will find screen time to bash the quacks at least once each episode. Likely the late night pundit will find time as well, as will the newscaster, completely coincidental. The reason I call this category of disease fake is because this seems like a scam. Why have 200 things we call a disease for problems we have eliminated in livestock a thousand years ago in ancient times, again in medieval times, and again in modern times? Modern medicine does not cure anything on the list. Dog food prevents all of it. Doctors manage the symptoms with drugs or surgery or psychiatry indefinitely. Dogs don't have health insurance. Many honest physicians refuse to recommend patients for joint replacement surgeries they know to be useless. But their toolkit still does not have much else besides pharmaceutical painkillers and anti-inflammatory drugs. Calling something a disease legally puts it in the umbrella of allopathic medicine. It doesn't matter if illiterate farmers figured this out a thousand years ago. In humans, a disease must be managed by a licensed medical practitioner. Unless you take things into your own hands. You are legally allowed to treat yourself. We're just not allowed to treat you. And you can represent yourself in court, or hire a professional and take their advice or take advice from a guy on the street, or the internet. As we go on, you can see how all of this legal language makes less and less sense when applied to health problems. It only makes sense when we realize it was designed to define medical practice itself. Each of the problems in the bone and joint category is due to a deficiency of the nutrient group that makes up bones. As a shorthand, we can refer to it as the calcium family. Sometimes we might even just say calcium but it is the entire web of nutrients around this important mineral that is also necessary for the proper structure and function of our body. Structure in this case is literal. Our bones are made of stuff that we need more of. Joints are made of the same stuff, more or less. And this mineral and its cofactor friends are also required for several functions in the body. Notice the behavioral problems in the list, and the soft tissue problems such as eczema and periodontal disease. If one nutrient or nutrient group is needed for a variety of functions in the body, in this case, the same mineral responsible for many functions is also a building material for the structure itself, as if a brick building were also lighted and heated by brick, then a deficiency in that nutrient can lead to a variety of problems. We cannot always predict which symptoms will occur with a calcium deficiency, since the body has to decide where to use it. You may have tooth decay but not back pain. You may have the whole list. The tree can fall in many directions. We like to refer to the wisdom of the body. The body is intelligent, we say. Smarter than our doctor, I might say, but intelligence can only go so far. If an intelligent body has to choose between functions because it has a lack of resources, the result is still going to be a problem. A professional building crew will have a problem if they are short on essential materials. A brand new car will not start without a spark plug. When minerals are used in functions in the body, rather than structure, it is useful to think of them as spark plugs. They activate things. They allow other processes to happen reactions to happen, and transmitters to fire, and so on. It is likely that someone with arthritis will also have other symptoms they recognize on the list at the start of this chapter. By addressing the underlying deficiencies involved in arthritis, they should find improvement in the other problems as well, because the same material is used as spark plugs for numerous functions as well as building material for the bones and joints themselves. There is an age-old saying in the holistic world, like treats like. This phrase is technically illegal if taken literally. The principle comes from what is known as the theory of signatures. A walnut looks like a brain and thus was thought to support and promote maintenance and repair of healthy brains. We do now know that walnuts and other such brainy foods are in fact high in the fat soluble nutrients required for optimal brain function. These are essential nutrients for many functions in the body, particularly the brain. 
The theory can be extended to red being good for blood, and of course, our point here, bones and joints being good for bones and joints. Yes, we cured this list of diseases and symptoms in animals a thousand years ago by adding ground bones and joints to livestock feeds. In the field, cows, horses, pigs, sheep, and goats will all opportunistically forage on small animals. Yes, horses and cows will eat small snakes, birds, rodents, eggs, and they will likely chew on any bones that happen to be in the fields. They do this instinctively. If an animal is mineral deficient, any mineral, but this calcium group in particular, this pica behavior will become stronger. They will chew on the wood of the barns or fences, the handles of tools, and each other's horns and even hooves. Typically this behavior can be stopped by giving them a salt block, also called a salt lick. The block contains a spread of trace minerals and should stop the cribbing, which is the gnawing, chewing, craving symptom of pica. This is the wisdom of the body. It requires minerals to maintain and repair its structure and function. It asks for these in the form of a craving. If the nutrients are not provided, the body will continue to be hungry. It will continue to crib. Most people just make the mistake of feeding the body food, rather than feeding it the missing nutrients. This problem is not helped by a medical profession that tells the public we can get everything we need by eating the food groups, and those people selling calcium are quacks. I mentioned salt and calcium together because they are important cofactors, and this is why I believe they can both be effective in eliminating the cribbing in animals and in humans. Bone and joint problems are a result of a lack of bones and joints, quite literally. Human populations in the wild use most of every animal they catch, including the bones. In many cases, the bones can be eaten directly from a cooked bird or fish or small animal. Bigger bones are often ground into a flour that is added into pretty much every type of dish you could name. Footnote 1. Fee fi fo fum. I smell the blood of an Englishman. Be he alive or be he dead, I'll grind his bones to make my bread. Jack and the Giant Beanstalk. Return to text. Other bones are boiled in soups or stocks. The natural human consumes bones in some form essentially every day. These diseases are fake because they are called diseases just so they fall under the jurisdiction of allopathic medicine. If these problems were called what they are literally, symptoms of multiple nutrient deficiencies, I imagine it would be very difficult to persuade a regular citizen to take pharmaceutical drugs with side effects and no promise of improvement and no cure word available. It would be more difficult to persuade a customer to have their knees replaced if it were called a nutrient deficiency. This is because deficiencies can be corrected. I hope that is obvious. It is not obvious to allopathic professionals. I have actually been called a liar by allopathic professionals for claiming that cartilage could be regrown. I didn't know it was a controversial claim. It is an observable occurrence. Remember that a disease is a name for a group of symptoms. If the symptoms are a result of a nutrient deficiency, then so are the diseases named after them. If a deficiency can be corrected, then the symptoms can disappear. This is not a miracle. This is farming. This is also not a cure. Again, we find that cure is not even an appropriate word here. The word disease is misleading because of this. Let's now cover the exception, rheumatoid arthritis. This view on rheumatoid arthritis is not accepted in the mainstream medical community. It is also not widely accepted in the alternative community. There is no agreement on what causes it. We have an explanation that is very hard to find if you just searched rheumatoid. You'll first find it being referred to as an autoimmune disease. We will cover autoimmune problems later. In our view, the rheumatoid component of the problem is an infection with a bacteria called mycoplasma. The infection causes damage. The proper response from a body when it is experiencing damage is to inflame. This brings blood and resources to the area. Pain signifies the desire for the body to keep you from further damaging the area. This particular bug is also known to cause respiratory infections, and this is probably why it is thought to be an autoimmune problem. In this case, the bug must be killed. As an alternative practitioner, I cannot prescribe pharmaceuticals. Dr. Wallach recommends minocycline. Of course, you would have to talk to a licensed medical practitioner about this. They probably won't believe you. But if you have been suffering, and nothing else has worked, it is probably not that hard to persuade them to give this a supervised try. There are natural antimicrobial compounds and products that can be effective if used seriously and in conjunction with a food protocol. But the pharmaceutical antibiotic is much more reliable. Once the bug is killed, the tissues need to be rebuilt just like any other bone or joint degeneration. It needs more of the stuff it is made of in order to rebuild itself. This book is not going to go into specific detail on products, doses, or diets. 
This is the base information, and I encourage you to contact us or whoever gave you this book to talk more specifically about what might be best for you. Our contact information is at the back of the book. Chapter 5. Blood Sugar Diseases Now things get a bit more complicated. We saw type 1 diabetes listed as a birth defect. Birth defects can be prevented, but not always reversed. People born with any birth defect also tend to have other health problems. Maybe immune problems, maybe weight problems, skin, digestion, brain fog, migraines, back pain. Just like any other person on the street, a type 1 diabetic or a cystic fibrosis patient can also have other common complaints or even another disease. Blood sugar is one of the problems that you can have with any other disease. The type 1 will probably need insulin for the rest of their lives. Footnote 2. Many people report that they were diagnosed as type 1 and no longer need insulin. Our assumption is that they were misdiagnosed and in fact were type 2 diabetics, which is reversible. Return to text. But other markers of health can still improve by correcting the diet and consuming all of the essential nutrients. The blood is the transport system of the body. It transports nutrients around and delivers them to the cells throughout the body. It transports oxygen from the lungs and nutrients from the digestive system. The veins in our body get smaller and smaller until they reach literally every other cell in our body. It is quite amazing. Everything is connected to the blood. Whatever food we eat, the body makes sugar and feeds it to our cells. Sugar is essential, but we don't need to consume it. We can convert fat and protein, as well as carbs, into sugar to feed the cells. We need nutrients to process sugar. We need nutrients to digest anything. Two of the key minerals involved in healthy blood sugar, chromium and vanadium, have at least 23 direct nutrient cofactors. Really, we would connect it all to the cake recipe of the 90 essential nutrients. But these two key nutrients are needed to process sugar. They are needed for healthy blood sugar. We know this from the animal industries, which eliminated all blood sugar related problems officially in 1957. This information was actually widely known at some time due to media publicity. Evidently, many of the listeners who ran out and started buying chromium and vanadium did not avoid the modern plagues of diabetes and related problems. This is because of the 88 other nutrients involved in a healthy body and the many other factors that can contribute stress on the system. So, we need at least two nutrients to process sugar, and those two are largely deficient in the food supply, soils, and home supplement cabinets. That's one part of the problem. The next part of the problem is the amount of sugar we actually eat. If we need one unit of X nutrient to process one unit of sugar, we are going to need much more of X nutrient if we greatly increase our average consumption of sugar. It is said that we modern society consume over 300 times the amount of sugar we did 100 years ago. We're claiming that we already had a nutrient deficiency problem going on back then, but then we increased our need for that nutrient on average by 300 times. So we need 300 times more of that nutrient and its cofactors for the body to be able to process the sugar we consume. Here is a list of potential symptoms or diseases related to blood sugar problems. Anxiety, adrenal fatigue or adrenal failure, bedwetting, cardiovascular disease, depression, diabetes, elevated cholesterol and triglycerides, fainting, hyperactivity, hypoglycemia, low blood sugar, infertility. Learning disabilities, migraine headaches, moodiness, narcolepsy, night sweats, night teeth grinding, obesity, peripheral neuropathy, retarded growth, short lifespan. Elevated blood cholesterol and triglycerides are the first sign of a blood sugar problem. The cellular explanation is quite complicated. The point is, anyone with a blood sugar problem or diabetes will most likely also have anxiety issues, chronic fatigue, high blood cholesterol, and ultimately a reduced lifespan. This is because the blood is the most important thing in the body. These warning signs like high cholesterol signify a major problem in the body. Circulation problems are inevitable if this continues. Healthy blood sugar is extremely important to a healthy body and a happy life. Blood sugar fluctuations, in our view, are given several disease names you will recognize. ADD, ADHD, bipolar disorder, seasonal affective disorder, mood disorders generally, autism, and other behavioral disorders. In the next chapter, we are going to cover digestion diseases, but it is worth laying some groundwork here. Any digestive problem, whatever it is caused by, can cause a blood sugar problem. A nutrient deficiency can cause a blood sugar problem, but a digestive problem can cause the deficiency. A digestive problem can interfere with nutrient absorption, in the end causing a blood sugar problem. Once there is a blood sugar problem, as we know, one of the first consequences is elevated cholesterol. One of the consequences of this is a compromised circulatory system. 
So how to have healthy blood sugar. Other than providing the body with the essential nutrients for the job, it is very wise of us to limit processed sugar to an absolute minimum. Often we are asked if it's okay to replace, say, sugar in coffee with honey or syrup. I usually say that this is largely more habitual or an actual addiction to sugar than any sort of necessity. Honey and syrup were prized and difficult to obtain luxuries in the wild environment. They are still luxuries and should be limited. Completely abstaining from all powder or liquid sugar for around two weeks is usually enough to break the cravings and the habit. Fruit or dried fruit is fine, but if you find yourself gorging on it, then you can see that there is a problem. Cut the body off from this addiction. We recommend replacing carbs in general and sugar in particular with various fats, proteins, and plant material in the diet. A sugar craving can often be stopped by eating protein instead or by consuming minerals. Even a glass of salty water can often stop a sugar craving. The last major component to healthy blood sugar is digestion, which will be covered next. But it is worth wrapping up blood sugar into the fake disease conversation by recapping that type 1 diabetes is a birth defect, and all birth defects are preventable, not curable, and so in my opinion, it should not rightly be called a disease. If it can be cured with treatment, then it is fine to classify it in responsibility to licensed professionals who handle treatment but we can't reverse birth defects that have already happened. The best we can do is support a healthy pregnancy. People are still walking for the cure for type 1 diabetes, but if they called it what they would in animals, a nutrient deficiency in embryo, then they could clearly see the real solution, prevention. All of those behavioral problems don't seem rightly described as diseases either. Ten years ago, I was under the impression that an autistic child likely had visible developmental problems as well. Now any kid with a behavioral problem, likely just a blood sugar problem, can be called diseased. This is not logical or fair. A blood sugar problem does not need to be managed with pharmaceutical drugs, none of which are designed to cure the problem, none of which could possibly cure the problem because the problem is caused by nutrient deficiency and the wrong foods. These things are called diseases so they can be treated by licensed allopathic medical professionals. It's big business, to put it lightly. Diabetes has been called the most expensive disease in recent years, before 2020 hit, of course. Blood sugar-related behavioral problems are not diseases. The body can achieve healthy blood sugar quite quickly. Type 2 diabetics regularly get off their medication, with or without the supervision or support of the allopathic medical doctor who put them on their drug program. In the case of type 2 diabetes itself, as well as all the behavioral blood sugar problems, the difference between reversal and cure is important. We don't catch diabetes or autism. Blood sugar is constantly in flux. If it is low, you might be moody. You might eat something and get a spike and then get tired. This can happen in minutes. And the body can achieve healthy blood sugar quickly as well. This can be measured by the regular mainstream medical world. Knowing all of this, I hope you can understand the frustration I have felt every time I see fundraisers to raise money for pharmaceutical research on these problems. The allopathic ways to interfere chemically with processes in the body. Most types of drugs are named by the way they interfere with something in the body. Anti-inflammatory drugs interfere with inflammation. Inflammation is a natural response to a damaged tissue or pathogen threat. A drug that blocks pain also blocks the signal our body is telling us to go easy on that area or address it. To me, any problem that we call a disease but is regularly prevented or even reversed in animals and also widely reversed in humans just should not be called a disease. That is false advertising. Things are called diseases so they can be treated by allopathic doctors, nurses, surgeons, and pharmacists. These professions do not claim to have a cure for these diseases. They only have pharmaceutical management or cutting out parts or replacing them. If we continue to think of behavior problems or blood sugar problems in terms of disease, we will continue to believe that these should be treated, of course by the only profession legally entitled to treat any diseases. Since it's called a disease, we run to a doctor. If we understand it as a process having to do with food, nutrients, and digestion, it is much easier to deal with yourself. Let's return to syphilis for a moment, because we are at the core of the whole fake diseases theory. Syphilis is a disease, correctly termed, because diseases should be treated by medical professionals, doctors, nurses, pharmacists. Surgeries and surgeons are necessary when a person is hit by a car, shot with a bullet, and also in removing growths in the body and other potential emergency interventions. This, in my opinion, should be the professional boundary of the allopathic profession. If you have syphilis, you should absolutely go to a medical doctor. 
The treatment is penicillin. It is cured, you pay, or insurance pays, and the deal is done. But blood sugar problems do not follow this logical route. Blood sugar problems do not require medicine. They do not require medical or surgical intervention or pharmaceutical intervention. Type 1 diabetes would seem to be an exception here. It does require management with insulin. Insulin is a hormone. It is packaged and prescribed by the medical profession, but it is not a drug, technically. It's called a drug because it's used to manage a disease. This one example of a birth defect being helped with a synthetic hormone gives justification for other diseases to be managed with totally different types of drugs. This also applies to some other drugs and cancer treatments. Lithium is known as a drug. In our field, we know it as an essential mineral, and we know it to be important for overall mental health. A mineral is a nutrient, and so it cannot be patented, but they can add a bunch of other ingredients and patent that. I still don't think it's correct to call type 1 diabetes a disease for this reason. It does not require a licensed practitioner to dispense a synthetic hormone. They sell vitamin D at the grocery store, an important and essential hormone. Even if a professional needed to be involved, they only need to be diagnosed once. The treatment is the same for the rest of their life, synthetic insulin. The rest of their blood sugar problems will be nutritional. If someone does not have a gallbladder, they need to supplement with digestive enzymes and bile to replace this function. It does not require a licensed practitioner to prescribe or sell digestive enzymes. We do not call this missing gallbladder disease. In type 1, a function is missing. A treatment will not bring it back, and so it will not be cured. We can replace the function without ever referencing a disease. Bone and joint and the long list of related calcium deficiency problems do not require medicine or surgery. Birth defects do not require medicine. For that matter, birth really shouldn't either. The only things we have encountered so far that deserve the legal title of disease are infections. Chapter 6. Digestion Diseases Healthy digestion is required for a healthy body. Correcting digestion alone can turn the average person's well-being around. If there is a digestive problem, the ability for the body to absorb nutrients will be compromised. We have already seen nutrient deficiencies as one of the most important aspects of what we call disease. A digestive problem left uncorrected is likely to lead directly to enough symptoms to be called a disease. Some digestive problems are called diseases themselves. I include these in my list of fake diseases because it makes absolutely no sense to call a digestive problem a disease. If you add sand to the gasoline before you put it in the car, the car will have a problem. Its performance will be impacted immediately, measurably, and noticeably. It will make zero sense to call this a disease. If you cleaned out the pipes and put clean gasoline in, the car will run fine, but you would sound foolish to claim that you have cured your car of a disease. And it would be criminal for a mechanic monopoly to charge you an arm and a leg to fix it. It would be much worse if that profession couldn't even fix it. They just kept it for testing indefinitely, removing more and more parts until it couldn't possibly drive. But insurance still paid. Imagine if mechanics operated like doctors. Here are some of the digestive problems and diseases, all of which are mechanical. Acid reflux, athlete's foot, celiac disease, Crohn's disease, constipation, dermatitis, diarrhea, diverticulitis, food sensitivities, gas, heartburn, hiatal hernia, indigestion, irritable bowel, leaky gut, jock itch, allergies, seasonal allergies, thrush, ulcerative colitis, yeast infections. The yeast infections and other fungal problems show up here because the digestive environment is the foundation of the immune environment. A digestive problem will most likely lead to an immune problem, and a proclivity to various infections like ear, sinus, respiratory, or urinary tract, as well as fungus, which appears in the symptoms of itches and smells, and bumps or dents under the skin or nails. The fungus, bacteria, virus, and parasites of all kind are always there, it seems. No matter where we are on Earth, if we have an unhealthy internal environment, we are likely to develop some kind of infection. The point of this becomes more important as we move through all of the physical diseases and into the more scary pandemics. The first major nutrient absorption that will be impacted by a digestive problem are the good fats. In our camp, all fats are good unless they are burned or oxidized. Oxidized fat or oil is called rancid in the books. Since a digestive problem can lead directly to tissue damage, inflammation, and pain, we get most of the list above as a direct consequence. But we don't catch these things. 
These are not diseases. These are plumbing issues, not doctor issues. It is not a medicinal problem or even a nutritional deficiency problem. The problems above are caused by eating the wrong foods. But more sinister are the resulting deficiency problems and so-called diseases, since the fat category is the first most likely deficiency to appear in the form of symptoms throughout the body, we should be familiar with the following list. Acne, alopecia, Alzheimer's disease, asthma, blood clots, brittle hair, cardiovascular disease, cracked heels, dementia, eczema, fibromyalgia, gallstones, growth retardation, infertility, kidney dysfunction, low libido, low sperm count, miscarriage, multiple sclerosis, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, Huntington's disease, Parkinson's disease, muscular dystrophy. End note 6. Muscular dystrophy was first mentioned as white muscle disease in animals. We know this is caused by a selenium deficiency in pregnancy, but there are many cofactors involved. Selenium is a fat-soluble mineral, and so it appears on the fat deficiency problem list as well because a cofactor deficiency will likely lead to several possible selenium deficiency problems. Return to text. PMS. Psoriasis. The blood sugar, digestion, and good fat problem lists combined are the majority of health complaints that people come to us about, and they are usually connected. Most people with one category of problem will have something in another. Many of them are serious, life-ruining, or life-ending. Even just one can ruin your life effectively. Constant stomach pain is miserable. It is impossible to enjoy life in such pain. Many of the things on this list are uncomfortable, inconvenient, and embarrassing. Of course, people want to get rid of these problems. But when they are labeled a disease or we go to an allopathic practitioner with one of these problems, the treatment offered will usually make the problem worse, unless they give alternative advice, which is unlikely. The allopathic toolkit for dealing with digestive problems consists of stomach acid lowering tablets, stomach acid lowering pharmaceutical drugs, removing parts of the intestines, choking the stomach with a band inserted surgically, removing the stomach, removing the problematic kidney, gallbladder, liver, appendix. That's pretty much it. This sounds too simple to be real. Do doctors really think like this? Well, not really. They have multiple barriers to understanding digestive problems because of the way they are taught about the body, the allopathic way. I genuinely think they just can't see any other way to deal with these problems. This is literally all they know. Our view is that the body requires all of its organs. Removing any of them will be a problem and shorten lifespan. It also doesn't address the original problem. The body also requires healthy stomach acid. In our experience, if a person is on stomach acid lowering drugs, proton pump inhibitors, they have very little chance of any improvement. There's not much we can do for them. They can't absorb our products or digest food correctly without a strong stomach acid. Getting off proton pump inhibitors can be miserable. It can take weeks. People are often tempted just to take the pill after a few days because of the stomach pain. But if they keep taking the pill, they will continue not producing stomach acid. Health will be harder and harder to attain. Advice on easing this process is in the notes at the end of this book. As alternative practitioners, we cannot tell people whether or not they should take drugs. The easiest thing for me to say is, I wouldn't. I wouldn't take a drug that prevents my stomach from working properly. We can also tell people that they can take whatever advice they like. They don't have to take their doctor's advice. Some drugs have withdrawal effects. This information is readily available online. Those ones should be weaned, is the advice usually given. Any other drug type we can basically get around. All drugs cause side effects, but we can still feed the body the right stuff it needs to heal itself, as long as it can be absorbed. Proton pump inhibitors just interfere with the whole process. It's impossible to digest correctly on them. I hope that's clear. One of my many health problems growing up was chronic stomach pain. I would never have known that the food I was eating was the only reason I was in stomach pain. I would never have known because my doctor didn't tell me. He said to take Tums. The next option is proton pump inhibitor drugs, which stop the stomach from working properly. Allopathic professionals are taught that when there is a problem in the body, the way to manage this is to block, stop, remove, or kill something in the body. They don't have the language, the education, or the technology to support the body. Everything in their toolkit regarding digestion aims to stop a process in the body. It is appropriate for syphilis, not for stomach pain. This point is excessively important. For a profession that only knows how to block things, you would think that they would see the obvious solution to a digestive problem. 
In most cases, they need to block the wrong foods from going down the hatch. That's it. In most other cases, they need more salt. Salt is required to make stomach acid. Stomach acid is required to break down food in the stomach before it goes into the intestines to be absorbed. Doctors messed up big time by erroneously blocking humans from consuming salt. Much of the stomach pain on earth is a direct result of this. In the health business, we make no money by promoting salt, but the products we are trying to sell our customers also need to be absorbed through the same route as food. If they have a digestive problem, not only will they have a health issue, but we will have a problem trying to help them. They need to absorb the nutrients. We love to point out that there isn't a farmer on earth who could be profitable without providing their animals with unlimited salt, as much as they want, any less than they will have a problem. The body is smarter than we are. A pig body is smarter than a human doctor. It knows exactly how much salt it wants. When it has had enough, it will stop licking. The horse or the cow or goat cannot physically lick too much. You could hold their head down in front of the salt block and it will not lick it. It is the same way with humans. As polite as you try to be, you will not be able to consume a dinner plate that is too salty. It will be one of the most repulsive things you've ever experienced. If you force this into your mouth, you will likely vomit. It would be rude of me to just point out that digestion problems are not actually diseases without stating how to correct a digestive problem. The first place to start is the salt. We have an extremely sensitive meter for salt. Things can become too salty with just a few extra shakes, but it is delicious until that point. The moment we have enough, it becomes repulsive. We teach people to act like livestock. Our salt meter is likely out of balance with our conscious brain. We often mistake a salt craving for a potato chip or candy bar craving. We mistake the body asking for salt and water for food and drink. I'm not recommending a salt lick in the kid's bedroom. I recommend a glass of water with three heaping tablespoons of salt in it. Mix it well. Natural salts are best for this, but it would work with table salt. It should be cloudy. Take one tiny sip. It should be the saltiest thing you've ever tasted. But chances are, it is stimulating, refreshing, and tastes surprisingly good. With each small sip, you get more and more used to it. If we are low on salt, it might be the best thing we've ever tasted. Most people can only take a few sips. It still feels nice, but it is very quickly too salty. If someone can drink a lot of the glass, or the whole thing, they are very low on salt. If someone has had a digestive problem, they will probably be able to drink a fair bit, or the whole glass. If someone is experiencing stomach pain, as they drink more of the salty water, they should feel soothing relief in the stomach. They may be driven to the bathroom for a vigorous expulsion. This is where we got the name salt flush from. There is a potential for temporary discomfort after a salt flush. If the person could only drink a bit of it, then there should be no negative effect. But if they could drink a lot or the whole glass, they could experience diarrhea, a migraine, a flu-like 24 hour to 48 hour experience, or they could vomit. Each is temporary, but the body will continue to adjust for weeks if the person has been severely limited salt. Unfortunately, if the body needed a lot of salt and it experienced a reaction like above, our recommendation is to try the salt flush again a couple days later. Fill up another glass and see how much you can drink. It should be much less than the first time. If there is an uncomfortable side effect, it should be much less than the first time. Repeat every few days until you can only take a few sips. That is where we should be at any given time, topped up. Now you should be in tune with your salt meter. Henceforth, you should be able to give your body exactly how much it needs. We wake up dehydrated, and some salty water in the morning is one of the best things we can do to rehydrate. Most of us will find that just a few shakes of a salt shaker is what our body is really looking for. Many of us feel that water without a bit of salt in it now tastes stale and boring. All you have to do in your daily life is use enough salt on your food or add it into your water, coffee, or tea, and you will have the raw material needed to make stomach acid. Some foods are harder to digest, meat particularly. Use more salt on these foods. Salt the food until you can taste the salt. Salt to taste doesn't mean salt as much as you feel like. It means add salt until you can taste the salt and then stop. Now that the stomach can do its job, we still have to make sure we're not putting the wrong foods in. It's more important to cover the bad foods because the list is much shorter than the good foods. In our business, we don't really care what you eat as long as it's not the bad foods. Grains will be the biggest problem in most people's diet. We would put special emphasis on the gluten grains, wheat, barley, and rye, and we would include oats and quinoa on the definitely avoid list. It tends to take about two weeks of total grain avoidance, like sugar, to break the addictive attachment to these foods. There can be withdrawal experience in the first few weeks avoiding gluten particularly, but it is worth it. 
If you had anything on the list in the digestive or blood sugar or good fat deficiency lists, it might disappear in a few weeks or months just by removing these grains from the diet. This information actually isn't that great for our business model. We have to, in good conscience, give all the information we have to offer. We offer supplement advice, which we sell, but we also offer food advice because food can be causing the problem. The problem for us is it is very common for our prospective customers to walk away with the food and salt information and completely turn around their health without buying products from us. That is how important digestion can be. If someone is in disbelief about gluten or grains, or they believe their doctor who told them there is nothing to worry about and to just eat the food groups, this is the pitch we offer. If someone avoids gluten completely for 14 days, number one, they will probably feel better by the 14th day. Number two, if they are in any doubt, we recommend consuming gluten with each meal on the 15th day. The pain endured by reintroducing gluten is usually enough to make the point. There could be other problematic compounds in the food, but it is most likely that this is the cause of the constipation, diarrhea, migraines, leaky gut, irritable bowel, and possibly even the eczema, psoriasis, and other soft tissue problems. Heartburn should go away with the salt flush, but it will come back by eating harmful foods. If the stomach can break down food with a strong stomach acid, chronic stomach pain should not occur. End note 8. This can actually get more complicated. A strong stomach acid is required to absorb most of the minerals, including calcium. Calcium is involved with all muscle contractions. It is muscle contractions of the chief cells in the stomach which squirt the acid into the stomach. So salt deficiency can contribute to the mineral deficiency of the mineral responsible for squirting the acid into the stomach. This is to get me off the hook if salt alone doesn't eliminate someone's stomach pain. There are more components to stomach acid and more nutrients involved in getting the acid where it needs to be. This is why we recommend all of the essential nutrients, including salt and calcium. Return to text. Acute stomach pain is likely with overeating. Relieve with the salt flush and decrease portion size in the future. As you improve digestion and health, you will not be able to eat as much as you used to. Intestines can take a long time to fully heal, but the longer someone avoids problematic foods, particularly gluten and other grains, the better they should feel. These two things, adding salt and removing gluten, will help anyone who tries, and in most cases they won't need to do anything else in order to experience healthy digestion. My favorite thing to add on top of this in the short term is diatomaceous earth. Diatomaceous earth is ground shell flour. It is one of the cheapest and most effective health products available on earth. I first learned of it in chickens. Our hens were not producing enough eggs. We were advised to add diatomaceous earth. Full production resumed within days. I learned that it is also commonly used in dogs and cats to kill worms and other parasites in the body. No drugs needed. Diatomaceous earth kills bugs and bad bacteria inside the body and outside. I plug up ant holes with it and they never return. Some health practitioners, alternative and mainstream, claim that using diatomaceous earth or psyllium husk or bentonite clay can damage the intestines or cause malabsorption of nutrients. In our experience with hair analysis, we have been unable to find any evidence of this. We have countless positive testimonials and no uncomfortable side effects that I am aware of other than a strong bowel movement. This is because, in addition to attracting pathogens and neutralizing them, diatomaceous earth clears out the pipes as it moves through the guts. We often deal with very overweight people. Some of them have reported losing 20 pounds through their bowels because of diatomaceous earth. This is in one day. Many of us are carrying around a lot of weight in the intestines that wants to come out. I assume at least that our body would want it out. When correcting digestion, I highly recommend adding two heaping tablespoons of diatomaceous earth to that morning salty glass of water. Don't use any metal. Use a plastic, wood, ceramic, or glass cup and stir stick. Metal will neutralize the electrical charge which is said to be the active component of the stuff. So if you use metal, it basically just becomes sand and will not give you the desired results. If the product isn't working at all, the manufacturer probably used metal. Diatomaceous earth has a very noticeable effect. For best results, do this two or three times a day for one to three months. Also, don't breathe the dust. It's never good to breathe dust. There are two other things worth mentioning here for correcting digestion. Doing all of these things at once practically guarantees a quick route to healthy digestion. The first is probiotics. These do not need to be supplemented, but it can definitely help to add them at the beginning. Some strains can produce a negative reaction. If this happens, switch to a product with different strains. Many brands are marketed to have less problematic strains in them. 
Seeking to eat fermented foods containing probiotics is a good idea. These foods are easy to digest, and so they are already a good idea for someone dealing with a digestive problem. And by providing more good bacteria, this is providing more of the raw material we need to correctly digest, absorb, and expel food. These foods can be eaten daily. The last thing I want to mention about digestion is digestive enzymes. Here it is necessary to point out that, if someone has had their gallbladder removed, that person needs to supplement with digestive enzymes for the rest of their life. When food is broken down in the stomach and driven into the intestines, it is met with several digestive enzymes which are responsible for certain proteins. The gallbladder is a little sac that releases bile containing some of these critical enzymes. Without these enzymes, several critical nutrients, including the good fats, cannot be absorbed. We saw the horrible list of fat deficiency problems at the start of the chapter. All of these can be caused by a lack of enzymes. A good enzyme product will contain a spread of enzymes as well as bile, ox bile usually. It should also contain some chloride compound, likely betaine hydrochloride. Stomach acid is mainly hydrochloric acid. Like salt, betaine hydrochloride serves to provide the raw material for the acid in the stomach. Someone without a gallbladder must do this, or it is impossible to correctly digest any food containing fat. But the rest of us can also benefit by using digestive enzymes short term. Taking one or two in the morning with that salty water is a great way to further encourage healthy digestion. Taking one or two more enzymes a few minutes before meals will further improve the odds that the meal will be digested uneventfully. If you have a gallbladder, this should only be short term. We produce our own enzymes in our body. When we are digesting correctly, properly nourished, and not overburdening our body with too much food, we will produce sufficient enzymes. There are other things that can help digestion and soothe stomachs, but these five things are a very powerful combination. Doing any one of them will likely show improvement. The more, the better. End note 9. I didn't find space to mention colon hydrotherapy in the main text. Many people promote various kinds of enemas. We do not promote them for health reasons. Enemas clean the rectal cavity. This is fine to do, but the plaque buildup is going to be mostly in the colon. I recommend colon hydrotherapy because I saw it remove plaque from me that years of good digestion and nutrition were not able to get rid of. I had practiced everything else mentioned, but I still had plaque in my colon. Colon hydrotherapy should be done by a professional, and it is not the cheapest therapy in the book, but it is comparable to the price of massage or chiropractic care. Regular interval sessions are recommended for best results. If you choose to do it, be prepared to do multiple sessions over a few months. The hydrotherapist you choose should also be a kind and gentle person. You should have a good feeling about them. This person will be in a small room with you with a hose up your butt for up to an hour. Return to text. Up until this point, most of the discussion has been largely mechanical. From here on in, we are going to cover more complicated subjects like cancer and autoimmune diseases but we have laid all the necessary groundwork. The reason these next subjects are more complicated is because there is more than one contributing factor. One of those factors is likely to be digestion. As we know, a digestive problem is likely to lead to a blood sugar problem, and so this is also likely to show up in a person with cancer or an autoimmune problem. The non-infectious diseases we have covered so far, as we have seen, can be explained directly. Something is missing or it is in the way. Well, we also don't catch cancer or an autoimmune disease, and though they are more complicated than a bone problem or a birth defect, they share the same roots. They are the more serious consequence of a body that isn't working properly, a body that isn't healthy, a lack of ease. What does a body need to be healthy? Enough of the essential nutrients to do the many jobs properly, and a clean environment to do it in. This is how the wrong foods or nutrient deficiencies have caused every non-infectious problem we have encountered so far. Chapter 7. Cancer. Cancer is definitely dis-ease, a lack of health. But to be a disease is to be classified as something requiring treatment from a licensed medical practitioner. We don't catch cancer, and as far as the mainstream medical world is concerned, we do not cure cancer either. If a cancer patient, by any route, ends up losing their symptoms, or improve on whichever measurements they are using, they can only be deemed in remission. There currently is not the legal terminology or framework to deem any cancer as curable. Doctors don't speak like that. They are not supposed to, and neither are we. If we were all in agreement that the word disease means a lack of ease, then this would be no problem. But we are taught about diseases in reference to this entire group of health problems, and we are all operating under a system which empowers only one profession to deal with them all. 
We could just call infections infections and change the legal status of treatment of disease to mean treatment of infection. That could be left in the jurisdiction of the allopathic medical profession. This ensures the appropriate prescription of pharmaceutical medication required to treat such problems. We could call all the other health problems something else. There would not be a need for this book in that case. We would treat infections as diseases by seeking medical intervention, and we would treat everything else as a multi-factored nutritional consequence. We could call them diseases and treat them by correcting our food and nutrition. We could call them something else if we choose. Or we could use the already existing framework in animal nutrition to correct our eating and nutrient intake and forget the names of these health problems. The animal breeder who supplements correctly will never have to deal with any strange name diseases. Cancer is not one thing. I don't believe cancer is even a thing, to be honest. Cancer seems to be the name they give when the body is failing rapidly and catastrophically, and doctors can't figure it out. In my view, cancer cannot exist unless multiple things are going wrong in the body. Since it is not caused by one thing, and since it can show up in any system in the body, this is why I do not think it is useful to view it as a thing. It is also not reversed by any one thing, but we will get more into that later. The language is important to start with. Syphilis is a thing. It's a bug. It's a noun. By our description of diabetes, diabetes is not a noun. It is a verb. A verb is an action or a process. Arthritis is not a thing. It's what happens when things are missing. It would be more appropriate to speak of a person who is diabetes in or arthritis in because that would describe the dis-ease as a process. When a human goes to a doctor and is given a Latin name for their list of symptoms, they are liable to walk away believing they have a disease. Have is a possessive word. A noun is a thing that can be possessed. But most of this book is not about nouns. A virus is a noun, but cancer is a poorly defined verb. If one thinks they have a disease, they might speak of themselves in this way. I am a diabetic. Claiming this identity cannot be helpful for the solution, because the noun disease entitles this person to the care only of the allopathic professions. Since they view all disease in this noun form, they only treat things. Since diabetes and cancer and osteoporosis and acne are not nouns, this treatment is useless, expensive, and potentially dangerous or deadly. On a psychological level, it is not helpful to believe you are diseased. I was born with birth defects and pain. I don't think of it as a disease. I didn't catch it from my mother. She was missing some things during pregnancy. That's it. Worse, since the cure word is practically unattainable to a patient with chronic disease, the person might be tempted to identify as a disease patient or survivor for the rest of their lives. Why not believe we can turn our health around by our own choices? Why not believe we can heal? This is a great time to focus on belief for a moment. Behind every therapy there is a belief that it will work or a belief that it will not work. Your mind is likely more powerful than the therapy. If you believe it will work or help, it will probably help, at least temporarily. If you do not believe it will work, it will probably seem like a waste of time. When it comes to people who claim to no longer have cancer, a lot of these testimonials are found inside content that is focusing on belief. A lot of this is religious. People believe they have the power to heal. They refuse the mainstream therapy, or they believe so strongly that the therapy will work because God has endowed these doctors that they survive normal healthy longevity. Atheists will call this placebo. Whatever we call it, I believe that belief is one of the most important components to both health and longevity. Super old people in interviews really don't seem worried about much. They believe it's going to be okay. They've seen it all before. They've outlived six husbands. They don't believe what the doctors today say because they've seen the mainstream opinion change many times throughout their lifetimes. In their youth, doctors might still have believed bad humors were the root cause of all disease. The oldest people we can find on earth tend to not have ever seen a real doctor. The point here is that it seems crucial to believe that life will go on, to believe that we will get over the sickness, heal the wound, or provide our body with the material it needs to have a decently functioning body. They say having a pet at home makes it more likely that you will make it out of hospital. The active ingredient here seems to be desire. People who want to get better are likely to. If belief is essential to good health, happiness, and longevity, then surely the belief that I am diseased must be destructive. If you believe the only hope you have is with an allopathic pharmacologist or surgeon, then your thoughts must be quite bleak. Might as well write the will, right? As we cover every successful aspect of healing I have encountered, it should be assumed that belief is a required ingredient. 
Belief and desire together will accomplish most things in life. In animals, this does not really matter. You give them what they need and they're fine. I don't think livestock have a negative attitude about treatments or the belief that they're not going to make it because they have a disease. I have never seen a cancer patient who had only one category of problem. Since we have mentioned belief, it is also worth mentioning that diseases of attitude often coincide with physical ailments. I have also never met a cancer survivor with a bad attitude. If anything, their experiences enhance their self-awareness, gratitude, and positive philosophies. This means that people in pain, or people identifying with the disease, often have a bad attitude as well. This really boils down to belief systems. Cynical, pessimistic, and nihilistic beliefs will pollute life in many ways, including, I think, in the chances that one will thrive physically or not. I have heard of many people with such a strong positive attitude that they essentially believe their way out of chronic pain or illness. Faith can heal. Think about it. Someone with a what's the point attitude is unlikely to even take a proper therapy regimen seriously. Lifestyle changes require discipline to implement. Good nutrition requires money and attention. The cynic is too busy being cynical to be healthy. I guess I'll just go in for the chemo. Sigh. Allopathic treatment is offered in a way that doesn't ask much from the patient other than obedience. Just show up, get in the machine, lay down on this, cough twice, take these pills, and call me in two weeks. The lazy person is a perfect victim for this sales pitch. Our pitch asks for quite a bit of commitment, and the customer has to pay for it, not insurance. But it might actually help. Most of the cynics will likely never know. But they might get their knees replaced. At least insurance pays. The Buddhists talk about the curse of the two arrows, or the two thorns. The pain is the first arrow. Stressing about the pain is the second. A guy gets the flu. That's one arrow. But he's really stressed about missing work. There's an important project on a tight deadline. His absence will surely cause a delay in the production schedule. His many bosses are not going to like this. The second arrow can be avoided. We are all going to catch a few thorns in life. Winters will come, and some years will be worse than others. Bugs will get us now and then. People we know and love will die. If we slack on our health, pains and symptoms will appear. But if we believe we are helpless against this, we will experience second and third arrows. If we identify as a victim of a disease, we will, for certain, experience many more arrows for the duration of our anguish. The seriousness of the diagnosis itself, the waiting, the testing, the conversations around the dinner table, the initial therapies and side effects, maybe some improvement, maybe not, doctors who aren't all that confident about any of this, doctors who, if you ask them with a straight face, what are my chances, if they are honest, they will answer, not good. None of this provides faith. None of this encourages healing. All of this is stressful. Stress is the opposite of relaxation. Relaxation is required for healing. The uncertainty and grimness surrounding disease provide nothing but fear and stress, the opposite of faith and rest. And this is anathema to healing. All of this is reinforced by media dramas that portray fighting cancer with poisons and machines. And we all know that even if we survive, we are likely to be greatly damaged by the treatment. We try to remedy all of this with understanding and confidence, but we are in a rough position with people from the start. One of the unfortunate aspects of being in the alternative health business is that most of our customers only find us after they have been wandering around the marketplace looking for answers already. Since the monopoly in the medical marketplace is held by the allopathic professions, most of our prospective customers have already undergone some form of mainstream treatment. So they already had a problem, then they took it to someone who made the problem worse, and now we not only have to help them, but also teach them to think about the entire process of disease differently than they've ever heard. It's not an easy business. In the case of cancer, that treatment, as usual, is mostly just pharmaceutical drugs that attack the body in some way. We all know the consequences of this innocently named chemotherapy. In my view, this is the most damaging part about cancer. It's not the cancer. It's the fact that the human has had to endure such chemical punishment. Second arrow via doctor. On my end, I know the person with a diagnosis of cancer needs a lot more support than the average person. They need a longer to-do list than the average person, and we would encourage them to take it much more seriously. I rarely encounter anyone who has done radiation therapy these days. Usually it's just chemo. They tell me it has become more widely believed that radiation is much more harmful than helpful. I would agree and am grateful that it is apparently becoming a rare choice of treatment. Of course, this is being phased out quietly by the allopathic world who promoted radiation as one of the only possible options for a cancer patient to survive. Notice I haven't really differentiated between cancers. 
To me, it doesn't matter whether it's breast cancer or blood cancer. Blood is much more serious, of course, but they are caused by the same combination of problems in my estimation. We alternative people don't have chemo things to use, or fancy machines, so it really doesn't matter what terminology we use, as long as we stay away from the forbidden treatment or cure. This is fine. We don't need to treat cancer, because cancer isn't the thing. Syphilis needs to be treated. If cancer is the result of a very unhealthy body, then we can encourage a healthy body in a number of ways. We have already explored digestion improvement. This, combined with good food habits and nutrient supplementation, can encourage healthy blood sugar. A consequence of a blood sugar problem is a circulation problem, and so a consequence of healthy blood sugar is likely to be healthy circulation as well. Healthy circulation is required for the correct delivery of nutrients, oxygen, and sugar to each cell and to transport the waste effectively out of the system. A circulation problem is a big problem. I believe every cancer has something to do with circulation. Digestion could be at the start of this chain of events. Nutrient deficiency is likely. Some legal claims have been won regarding specific nutrients and cancer benefits. End note 10. There are too many to properly cite. Every qualified health claim granted by the FDA has a large and solid body of evidence involved in the case. Return to text. These, in our view, are simply essential nutrients and antioxidants that are doing their job. Their job is to keep the body healthy. A healthy body does not have cancer. One of the potential consequences of an unhealthy body is cancer. You can see the hoops we have to run through even to explain cancer in a way that begins to make sense. Calling it a disease never made sense if we are supposed to think about diseases as a thing requiring treatment. On top of avoiding foods like gluten that screw up the digestive system, it is wise to avoid foods that are known to increase the likelihood of developing cancer. The words here are again important. A lot of people are these days talking about meat causing cancer, but technically we can only demonstrate certain foods as increasing the likelihood that a person will develop some form of cancer. Some meats are on our bad list, and we will cover them. Top of our bad list is liquid oils. Oil is present in every tissue in nature. It is protected from oxidation by the skin, peel, or shell. Once the protective barrier is broken or the plant or animal dies, the oil begins to oxidize. Oxidized oil is called rancid. The name sounds gross because it is. It is rotten fat. Oxidized fats contain a large amount of free radical oxygen particles. Unstable oxygen particles. End note 11. Chemists might not appreciate my simplicity in this description. Several of the compounds responsible for foods on our bad list have their own names like acrylamide or heterocyclic amines. I am calling it all free radical damage for simplicity. Return to text. The body uses an array of compounds called antioxidants to combat free radical particles. Some of these are also considered essential nutrients such as zinc or vitamin C. Some antioxidants such as glutathione we produce ourselves in almost every cell in our body. This master antioxidant requires one of the more important minerals, selenium, to function. This is mainstream textbook stuff, but it isn't applied generally in the human population or in allopathic medical recommendations. This is because this is not medicine. Selenium is a nutrient, not a medicine. Allopathic professionals are not required to learn anything about nutrition. Nutrients are not able to be patented, so the development end of this industry does not have much to gain by pursuing selenium treatment. The only possible outcome in giving more of this essential nutrient is healthier patients, which is not very profitable for an industry that legally only treats disease. Interesting that doctors are not supposed to sell products, and they are not supposed to be paid to recommend drugs either. They are supposed to be unbiased professionals, but if they recommend simple nutritional strategies such as food avoidances and nutrient supplementation in almost every type of disease they would never need to see their patients again. We definitely would not need as many doctors on standby to help the everyday ailments. People wouldn't be getting joint replacement surgeries if they were rebuilding their skeletons with nutrition. People wouldn't be getting stomach surgeries because they would stop eating the foods causing the problems. People wouldn't be getting cancer treatments with drugs and radiation because they would be supporting a healthy body and a healthy body doesn't have cancer. This point is already obvious to much of my audience. If the job of a doctor was to help people get healthy, they would put most of the profession out of work. I'm allowed to sell products. In exchange for not being allowed to treat people, I am given free license to help people get healthy. If my customers fail to get results, they will not buy my products again. Since I expect most of my income to come from residual customers, people who buy the same products over and over, tell their friends, and so on, it is in my financial interest to help them any way I can. 
If my customers achieve perfect health, I will make the most money from them. It is interesting to compare this to the allopathic professions, depending for their business on steady and growing sickness. As businesses operate on inflationary assumptions, the medical profession within the capitalist system must also expect growth. This means more sick people. Without more sick people, the medical industry will be at a loss. This is basic but important, especially when we are talking about huge industries like cancer, diabetes, and bone and joint diseases. Free radicals are produced in the body when we exercise and when we digest things, when we use energy, basically. It is a natural byproduct of life. In the normal amount of exercise and digestion, and the adequate nutrient and antioxidant levels available, the body is able to deal with the regular burden of free radical damage. In addition, with all the nutrients present and a good digestive environment, all the cells in the body are able to regenerate with only a small margin of error. This accounts for gradual aging, but it does not account for disease, unless there is much more than a normal amount of degeneration. So, free radicals can damage cells. That's natural. We regenerate and move on. Too much free radicals can quickly become a big problem, especially in a modern environment critically lacking many of the essential nutrients and antioxidants. Recently, health foods have begun marketing products without oil. This is good, though it is still hard to avoid oil if eating any packaged or processed foods. There are other sources of free radicals. Car exhaust, industrial activity, and other established pollutants all result in a free radical burden on the body. Air quality in major cities has been improving in recent years, but it is not air that poses the most serious threat. We can't breathe as much as we can eat. A small serving of oxidized oil is much more harmful than the particles in air. Fried food is much more dangerous than smoking in this equivocation. Baked potato skins are also on our list for the same reason, an end result of too much damage to compensate. If you eat baked potato skins regularly, you will have a problem. Boiled is fine. Raw is probably not fine, but I don't recommend trying it either way. One baked potato skin, nice and crispy, has a large ratio of free radicals per gram of total weight. One baked potato skin weighs much, much more than an entire carton of cigarettes when smoked. Smoke is bad for the number of chemicals in it which ultimately lead to the same consequence, the need for much more nutrition and antioxidants to attempt to deal with the damage. But smoke doesn't weigh much, so even if it was 100% free radicals, it would still be hard to compare to a food source. Since there is much more weight of these toxic particles in food than smoke, eating is our primary source of free radicals. This is why most people with lung cancer do not smoke and never did smoke. The huge majority of cases never smoked. It never did make sense that secondhand smoke caused more cancer than smoking. That was a clumsy explanation by a profession who does not know what causes, prevents, or cures any cancer. And they don't say this very often anymore, probably because of how silly it sounds. It suggests that we might as well smoke, because it appears to offer a statistical benefit. The major sources of these same types of chemicals are in foods and how we cook them. Standing over a deep fryer or a stovetop pan cooking something with oil will likely lead to more free radicals in your lungs in minutes than you would get from weeks of heavy smoking. This is weight. Oil particles are heavy. Potato skins add up. And the next ones on our list are heavy sources too. When we start talking about the weight of a bowl of deep fried onion rings, in my estimation it is physically impossible to smoke that much. The person would die of smoke inhalation, not cancer. Well done red meat, or any burned animal fat, or any charred food, is also a major source of free radicals. We cannot consume enough nutrients or antioxidants to combat the damage of regular consumption of these foods. Processed meats containing nitrogen compounds are on our list as well, for the same end result, free radical damage. This is most of our list, actually. End note 12. Bad list. Gluten. Oats quinoa, grains. Rice is probably okay, but grain-free is probably best. We don't want a grain-based lifestyle. Liquid oils, heated oils, old oxidized fatty foods such as nuts or peanuts, deep-fried foods, burned butters, burned animal fats, well-done red meat, meats processed with nitrates, nitrites, or a celery product, carbonated drinks, baked potato skins, non-organic soy or corn. Every person could have foods that are not on this list which do not agree with their body. An elimination diet will help you find any of these. The diet we recommend is close to keto. Fruits and vegetables are all fine and good, 
but there are some technicalities that will matter if you are trying to optimize. Our food Instagram account, at Notice Foods, and YouTube channel, Notice Foods, is hosted by talented cooks and bakers and will answer any questions in the inbox. Return to text. These major sources of damage to the body bring us to the heart of what I believe cancer to be. Free radicals demand resources in the form of antioxidants for the body to attempt to deal with. This process also requires essential nutrients as the spark plugs involved in these functions. As the demand for antioxidants increases, as does the demand for the essential nutrients involved, these nutrients are also required for numerous other functions in the body, including a healthy immune system and cell regeneration. If the body has to make choices about how to devote limited resources, it is likely to attempt to deal with the most pressing situation at hand. If the most serious ongoing situation in the body is a constant attack by the overconsumption of free radicals and other toxic compounds, then the body is forced to divert significant resources just to deal with the daily damage from the diet. This leaves those other important functions hanging. What is the immune system to do if there is not even enough nutrients available to handle breakfast? Since essential nutrients are required for every function in the body, this type of situation can lead to a problem anywhere in the body. I believe it is this state, this nutrient-deprived free radical war zone, that results in problems that are called either cancer or an autoimmune disease. We will cover autoimmune problems next, but I wanted to mention that I don't think there is much difference. Many people say sugar feeds cancer. I think this view makes more sense in view of this explanation. Sugar also demands significant nutrients, produces free radicals, and blood sugar problems lead to numerous other problems. In my experience, every cancer patient I have dealt with had some blood sugar symptom on their list of problems. Whether they had that before their cancer diagnosis and treatment, I can't be sure. I only see them after. Having said all of this, now the experiences I will share next will hopefully make more sense. In my time in the business, I have met many people who told me they had cancer and that they no longer do. I have heard a huge number of things attributed to this success. I have noticed some commonalities. The most common story I have heard emphasizes fasting. This means not eating. All food requires nutrients and energy to digest. There are toxic byproducts to digestion that the body must also devote nutrients and energy to dispose of. Even good food costs the body to digest it. Too much food is one of the most common problems in the modern world in my opinion. Not eating immediately lifts this burden. Nutrients that might have been used to digest can now be used to maintain and repair the body, or support the immune system. I didn't mention fasting in the digestion section because I wanted to mention it here. Fasting for short periods, intermittent fasting, or longer periods, is one of the easiest ways to aid digestion. If there is a digestion problem, it is highly likely that the conveyor belt of our digestive system is overloaded with food. Even 24-hour diners close once a year to clean out the kitchen. Fasting allows the body to deal with material that needs to get out. Fasting can make people feel wonderful and light. Bowel movements can continue for days without food, proving how behind schedule the system has been. Fasting can also reduce hunger. It is common to find one of the immediate consequences to disciplined fasting is a general decrease in the desire for food. People having trouble controlling portions will find this one of the most useful ways to change this habit. Fasting can be difficult if a blood sugar problem is present. If you become dizzy or lightheaded, it is okay to break the fast. Some dried fruit, especially dates, are usually a quick way to bring up the blood sugar. Eating fat or protein will provide more satisfaction than carbs or sugar. Salty water, salty broth, or fruit or vegetable juices will also likely allow a person to dramatically decrease the amount of food burdening their system. Very often, we confuse thirst for hunger. As a person improves their overall health and digestion, fasting will become easier and more physically enjoyable. Working on an empty stomach is quite healthy. Of course, we have all heard stories of people who jumped into consuming a majority of their food in juice form and experienced impressive health improvements. Many of them show no signs of their past diseases, including cancer. We can see why this is one of the things that could contribute to a healthy body. Juices are concentrated foods. They are easier to digest and so they require less overall work and more payoff because they are more nutritionally concentrated than solid food. Since they are more nutritionally dense, they are more satisfying. In this process, we consume less calories. Excess calories burden the system, producing free radicals when digested. Juices also tend to not contain the bad foods we've listed so far. Juices should not have gluten, oil, baked potato skins, well-done red meat, burned animal fat, charred food, 
or processed meats in them. Not the kind of juice I'd like to drink anyways. This is the next reason why both fasting and juicing show great results in pushing people towards health. They are not the bad foods. Avoiding the foods that contribute the most damage to the body is probably important if we want to avoid chronic disease. So when a strategy happens to limit the consumption of these foods, there will likely be a lot of success stories. This also explains why many diets are successful in the short-term turnaround of people from catastrophic disease states like cancer. The raw vegans won't be eating any of those things above. If you only eat fruit, you are avoiding all of the things above. If you subscribe to the paleo diet, you are avoiding all of these foods or most. Any diet that avoids gluten, oil, burned foods, or processed foods, or any combination, will have followers who claim to be in remission from cancer. And I believe them. None of this is a cure, to be clear. These are only some of the things that contribute to stress within the body, and some of the things that ease that stress. Under the belief that the body can maintain and repair itself, this is our main task if we want to actively encourage a healthy body. If there were one magic compound that disappeared the symptoms of cancer, we could call it a cure. The people running for a cure seem to be hoping for something like this. But this will never happen. Since no cancer is caused by one thing, it will never be reversed by one thing. Let's focus on the word stress for the moment. Free radical stress is one form of stress. Digestive distress is another. Nutrient deficiency is a stress on the body. There are many forms of stress, all of which contribute to a state of dis-ease. Consequently, strategies that alleviate stress in one form or another are invariably successful in reducing symptoms of an unhealthy body, including cancer. This is why I have heard so many stories of people who got a serious diagnosis of some kind and rather than undergo a chemical or surgical procedure that the allopathic professional assured them would be painful and with slim chance of success, they chose to move back home or go on an extended fishing trip instead. Their reasons differ. Some people said they wanted to spend their last days doing something they enjoyed, catching up with and cherishing time with loved ones, or crossing off things on their bucket list that they always wanted to do. Some people didn't have the money for conventional treatment and were forced to do nothing. Many of these people simply just carried on. Some people were devastated by the news of a terminal illness. They were determined to beat it and they searched for strategies that could help them get healthy. Most of what I have mentioned so far is common knowledge in the alternative health world. A lot of the camps focus on one part or another of the strategies we've mentioned, but the information is there and many people find it on the internet or find us at health shows, conventions, expos, seminars, and Facebook groups. Anything that relieves stress on the body or mind will be good for the body. A stressed body is not going to be worried about healing. Fight or flight is one state of being, and rest and restore is the other. We cannot be in both modes at the same time. This is not scientific, it is grandma's recipe. We cannot digest adequately if we are exercising vigorously. We're not supposed to eat before swimming. People stressed about a breakup or a job loss tend to become uninterested in food, or they could even eat obsessively. Obsessiveness distracts from feeding the body or distracts from responsibility generally. By the same token, being given a diagnosis by a medical doctor is often very stressful itself. We are told we have a disease and then presented some painful options, none of which are promoted with the intention to cure the problem. This fear instilled by the medical profession is in my opinion responsible for quite a lot of unnecessary suffering. One of the positive benefits we should enjoy by seeking professional medical attention is the relief that the responsibility is being handled by someone who knows what they are doing. But if the medical monopoly has mislabeled many things diseases just so they can treat them, they might not be able to offer any hope if those problems are not successfully treated by allopathic protocols. This means, if a drug or surgery can't immediately fix the problem, then the doctor probably can't help. So they can't offer the consolation you would get from somebody who knows what they're doing, since in these cases, they in fact do not know what they are doing. On top of gaining control over our own digestion and nutrition, it is wise of us to put conscious attention towards rest and relaxation. Here is a short list of things that can encourage relaxation. Sleep. Hot shower, bath, or sauna. Sunbathing. Swimming, yoga, hugs, cuddling, massage, fishing, golfing, other leisure sports or games, reading, arts and crafts, playing with animals, acupuncture, or any therapy that is relaxing, such as sound therapy, aromatherapy, or meditation. Taking all of this into consideration, if I was given a diagnosis of a disease, any disease, I would pick as much of the topics covered so far and implement the strategies. 
If it was cancer, which is the very serious end of the scale of an unhealthy body, I would do every possible thing on the list that could help support and promote maintenance and repair of a healthy body. If I was determined to live and wasn't messing around, this is exactly what I would do. I would listen to the advice of the doctor giving me the diagnosis. I would take notes and ask as many questions as possible. If I was at all considering their advice, I would ask if I could contact a few of their past patients to ask about their experience with the treatment. Having read up until now, I have a good bit of advice to start with. I should remain calm. In fact, after such a stressful and worrisome encounter, I should stop and get a massage or a sauna or a saltwater swim in before I go home. Maybe a workout. Maybe a walk by the water. When I got home, I would hug my wife, tell her I love her, and ask to sit down for a serious conversation. The tone of this conversation would not be, I've got cancer. The tone would be, honey, my body is clearly overwhelmed and undernourished. We're going to need to get rid of those bad foods we still have in the house. We're going to need to make sure there is no gluten, oil, or burned food in our diet. I'm going to stop all the candy and stuff, cold turkey, until my health is completely on the upswing and my doctor is no longer worried. I am confident that I can restore my body to health. I will need your help, and I will need to divert a bit more money to health products for at least a few months. This alternative guy I talked to said I should put down at least a few hundred bucks if I want to give it my best shot. Realistically, if it were me facing losing it all, I'd do more than just the basic essential nutrient recommendation. That's what we're supposed to need to maintain. If we're sick, we need more. I'd first increase the selenium. I wouldn't go over one milligram. No need to. I'd also increase antioxidants as much as physically possible. Luckily, both of these types of products are not very expensive. Daily, I'd be staying hydrated. I'd use enough salt. I'd take all 90 essential nutrients with extra selenium and antioxidants. I'd seek to eat fermented foods and bone broth daily to further support a healthy digestive system. I'd buy a good juicer and start experimenting with many juices, adding in a bunch of my supplements to make it easier. In my concoctions, I would add a sea green. Spirulina and chlorella are cheap and I would buy bags of it. I would add colloidal silver in. We haven't mentioned it much because there isn't that much to say. It is one of the strangest of the essential nutrients. It seems to have no metabolic role. It's not a cofactor or a building block or a spark plug like the other nutrients. It's not a hormone. It just seems to kill bad stuff inside and outside the body, selectively. It is said to support the immune system and promote healing, but we don't really know how. I have a lot of great testimonials with colloidal silver. I know a guy who makes it in big jugs. He gets great results with people because they can afford to take so much at his price. It will not turn you blue, by the way. That is a myth because it involves a silver salt, not colloidal silver. Anyway, in goes a shot of colloidal silver into my daily drink. It doesn't actually get that much more complicated than this. I would get serious about avoiding the bad foods and serious about putting in as much of the good stuff as I could afford. But it's not an endless list. There are a few more things on it and we will get to them, but the rest of my focus for healing would simply be to stay positive and repeat this nutritional strategy every day. I would remain calm and expect months of this discipline at least to really make the changes and heal the body. If I had a stressful job, I would talk to my bosses. I would see if I could take some time off. Maybe I can work from home or reduce hours or workload. Maybe I can have an assistant assigned to help get the important project done before I die. If it was an unpaid vacation offered, I would see if I could take a loan to cover me a few months. I would ask family or friends if I needed it. I would at least tell them what I'm trying to do and the type of help I could use. This is life or death. It's worth some sacrifice, in my opinion. I have never faced cancer, but I have lived with pain. Knowing what I know now, there isn't much difference between the protocol for back pain and cancer. Both focus on loading the body up with nutrients and eliminating the problems. And the next biggest factor is stress. I mentioned that circulation is likely to be involved in any cancer. I would say all cancer includes a circulation problem, but I don't think I can back that up adequately in this type of a book. So I say it is most likely the case. And so I would also do as many things that promote circulation as I could. Since my morning nutrient shake above only took a few minutes out of my day and I'm well rested, I have the rest of the day to do something that encourages lymphatic movement, circulation, and low impact exercise. Different types of massages, swinging on a swing, jumping on a trampoline or rebounder, even riding a roller coaster, all promote fluid movement in the body. You can feel it with the whooshing feeling going down the hill in a car or in a swing. All of these are useful and interchangeable, and there are treatments you can pay for which can promote circulation big time. 
Professional massage, acupuncture, and cupping will be the most widely available therapies stimulating blood and lymph circulation. There are also machines available. A common one is called a shaker machine. It's a platform that shakes. More expensive models will have a wider range of functions, but they're all just different types or force of shaking. People with serious circulation issues will only be able to stand on the low rumble setting until they improve their circulation enough to tolerate higher vibration. As they improve overall, they can increase the setting. This should be done multiple times a day. In our real life store in Windsor, Ontario, we have one of these machines. They are extremely useful both for improving circulation and for measuring the progress. Typically within a few weeks, a person can work their way up from a low rumble setting for a few minutes to the strong, firm vibration on the higher settings for a longer time. Some of these people can now walk again without pain. Some of these people were able to avoid limb amputation surgeries recommended by their physicians. Since blood sugar problems cause circulation problems, a result is limbs susceptible to gangrene and eyes susceptible to blindness. These are circulation issues. The shaker machine we have retails around $1,000. It can run 24 hours a day and the average person will get huge benefit by standing on it for only 20 minutes a day. Just like a decent little low impact exercise session. This mimics much of the benefits of low impact exercise without the exercise. I'd also like to mention children. Sometimes we see children with cancers, but not often. They tend to go to cancer hospitals, not alternative people. But we see lots of kids with blood sugar problems. As I believe there is an immediate circulation problem whenever there is a blood sugar problem, I also believed that the circulation machines would be helpful for a kid with a blood sugar problem. This thought did not occur out of the kindness of my heart. I was dealing with a woman, sat down at the table discussing her quite serious health problems, and her child was running around our store, knocking things off of shelves and generally acting chaotically. I called him over, asked him to try one of our pure colloidal mineral product samples, then another, and another. Then I asked him to try the shaker machine. I put it on the highest setting and he was completely glued to it, staring straight ahead with blank but focused attention, like someone had turned him off with his eyes still open. Small skinny kid, maybe 10 years old. He stayed there and he stayed quiet and when he got off he said it felt really good and his body was still tingling and still felt good. I began recommending it to children every time I had to talk seriously with their parents. We also have something called a chi machine. It's a small box with two foot holsters. You lay down on a table or the floor, rest your feet in the holsters, and it sways back and forth in a steady, rhythmic way until the timer stops. It is extremely simple and extremely effective. While doing it, it doesn't feel like much. Many civilians were clearly embarrassed to be laying on a massage table at our quack store with legs swaying back and forth. At least we don't make them pay for it. But when the machine stops, a wave comes from the feet, up the body, like the feeling of getting off a small boat onto the shore. If the person's circulation is fine, that wave will go all the way to the head, back down the body to the feet, and most are all of the way back up to the head. If their circulation is poor, the wave won't go very far. As they do more sessions of about 10 or 20 minutes each day if possible, they should quickly find the wave traveling farther up the body, until it is normal. At this point they should feel much better overall. This feeling of mechanical circulation stimulation can be quite addictive. It feels very good even when we have nothing wrong with us. A chi machine costs about $50 on the low end and only a few hundred on the high end. These are not high tech tools. One shakes, the other sways. If you can get to a park and ride the swings, that is free. You will get great benefit to do that with discipline, 20 or more minutes a day until you feel much better overall. We have one more machine at our disposal that I should mention, because it's also deceptively simple. It's called a neuro massage machine. It is names like this that make me understand why we are sometimes thought of as quacks. It is just a massage chair, a blindfold, and headphones that play relaxing sound sequences in tune with the massage. It's really relaxing, and that's all it is. If you came to us in real life, we really don't have much in the form of emergency treatments, but sometimes people stumble into us in a state of near emergency. Our store is across the hall from a busy pharmacy and a walk-in clinic. We had a lot of spillover. The clinic offered methadone treatment for drug addicts and fentanyl for accident victims, so you can imagine that some real weird cases came from there. Not really being equipped to handle a crisis, we're still willing to help. Sometimes the doctor in that walk-in kicked out people for being unruly. We'd literally be their last hope in greatest time of need, and of course the toughest type of people to deal with. We offer a glass of very salty water. We offer some raw liquid plant-derived minerals that are so strong they taste like mineral whiskey. If we are feeling generous, we can add more sophisticated supplements to the drink we offer them. We have a shaker machine, a chi machine, and a fancy relaxo chair. 
and we have people who swear that this short list of things help them in an hour more than their doctors help them over a lifetime. There are also people out there walking around who will swear to you that I changed their life only with a glass of salty water. Some of these people consider these experiences miracles, but I don't. These are all completely mechanical protocols. I do have something to say that is closer to magic. I'm going to use this to lead into the next chapter on autoimmunity. The list of things we have covered so far is most of the story, but there is more, and the first time it really made sense to me was with lupus. Chapter 8. Autoimmune Diseases I'm going to take a curveball approach to this chapter, and I'm going to tell you this part of the story in more detail, or else you might not believe me. Years ago, we had a booth at a small health fair. It was at a large church in the small town I lived in. It was like a farmer's market with produce, but there were also various alternative health advocates there promoting all kinds of things. There were small honey farmers, yoga instructors promoting their businesses, and people like us selling packaged supplements and giving out information. There were a few speakers inside, but I didn't see them because I was at the booth. Like most health fairs, it was pretty quiet, so I was talking with the other vendors and checking out their products and services. I like to hear the pitch, whatever it is, and vendors are great prospects for my business too. To use the washrooms, we had to go inside the church. To go inside, I was told that I could not bring in any device that had a signal turned on. If I wanted to go inside, I had to show that airplane mode was turned on, data and Wi-Fi signals turned off, or the whole phone off. I had never been asked to do this before. The explanation was that one of the speakers claimed to be extremely sensitive to electronic signals. He was there to give a talk about electronic frequencies and radiation. I decided I was going to speak to him after his talk. Conveniently, he came out to our booth and introduced himself. He used very simple language. He could feel the signals. It could be described as annoying or uncomfortable or even painful, which is why he requests a room free of it. But he said, the real importance is long term. Whether you can feel it or not, it's there. It could be affecting the body all the time. He wasn't crazy, by my observation. He was straightforward and reasonable. I would call him a straight shooter. A bit kooky, but I probably am too. I liked him and I enjoyed his story and for the first time I thought about invisible energy waves radiating from everything around me. I went home and I looked out the window at the cell phone tower across the river, suddenly seeming ominous, yet I hadn't really noticed it before. I never saw that guy again and I didn't do much research. I was busy with other things, but I began to pay more and more attention to electrical devices. I didn't know if I was playing tricks on myself or whether I could really feel the computer mouse buzzing my hand. I began to think that I was becoming more sensitive just by paying attention. The buzz or hum of different devices around my apartment began to bother me. When the refrigerator was running, I felt unease. For a long time, I told myself that I was making this up because I was expecting it. My increasing awareness didn't cause any pain or discomfort. In fact, my pain and discomfort had almost entirely disappeared since I had started the nutrition program I was promoting. But it was more and more annoying. I felt that I was pretty tolerant of difficult conditions. I've lived in very cold and very hot places. I have dealt with serious infections, I have conquered chronic pain, and I have felt confident in traveling almost anywhere in the world by myself and with little money. The growing annoyance from the electronic devices seemed eventually to challenge my patience and resolve like no other challenge in life ever had. Because I couldn't avoid it, once I noticed it, it was everywhere around me. I felt paranoid and I knew that describing this whole thing would make me sound crazy. I didn't want the bed near a wall outlet. I didn't want to sit near a fridge or an electric oven when it was running. I didn't want my phone in my pocket or near my head. I had never been particularly picky about music quality. I cared whether I liked the music or not. My father was an audio technician and a musician, so maybe I picked up on some things. But until this point in my life, I was content to listen to the music I liked on any device that was convenient. As I became more sensitive to frequencies in general, I found that digital music began to sound off flat and lifeless, like distilled water without salt. Sometimes it sounded offensive. I liked the music, but not the sound. My favorite music didn't sound right on the computer or mp3 or CD. It sounded fine on my analog system. Somewhere in this time I was visiting my mother. At the local flea market, I saw that one of the vendors had a product from the company I was promoting. I stopped to talk to him about it. He was an enthusiastic distributor as well, but that was not what his booth was about. He asked if he could try a demonstration with me, and we did. He proved to me that my balance was terrible in general, and that it was even worse with a phone in my hand. I couldn't argue with it. Then he put a magic disc on a cheap nylon strap on my wrist, and did the test again. He was twice my age and easily twice my strength, but with the magic disc and the same test as before, my balance and strength was incredibly enhanced against his force. 
My first skeptical instinct was that he might have been yanking my arm out sideways on the first test, making me look very easily toppled. If he aimed straight down on the next test with the magic disc, then I should appear much stronger. But it was no trick. My girlfriend was there watching, we did it multiple times, and quite honestly, I trusted the guy as soon as we started talking. I felt he was hard-headed but genuine. I felt he really believed in his magic bracelets. I didn't buy anything from him. Back at my mother's house, she told me that someone was renting her garage for storage. There was a car and a bunch of other stuff. I didn't think anything of it. It turned out that the guy renting the garage was the same guy at the flea market selling the magic bracelets. His name is Mike. The stuff in the garage was his summer car and all his stuff behind the flea market business. I called him. He came by the house. We introduced each other more formally, shook hands, and he made me a steel bracelet with two magic discs attached, right there on the driveway. I didn't feel much when I put it on, and I also wasn't paying that much attention. We were in town for some event, and we were on the move. I kept the bracelet on, and we went back to our little town. My girlfriend at the time got her wisdom teeth taken out. She was in bed with chipmunk cheeks in a drugged stupor, and I thought that letting her wear my magic bracelet might help her a bit. She saw the demonstration and was just as impressed and puzzled as I was. You hear of carnival trick quacks at flea markets, but you really don't often encounter them. I gave her my bracelet, and the moment I took it off, it felt like I had taken the battery out of my back. It felt like my body was telling me directly, put it back on. I didn't have a lot of money at the time, but I called Mike and asked if he could give me a deal on another bracelet. He did. I have worn one since. Until this point, I can't recall really believing that fate had much to do with the turn of events, but meeting Mike would end up being very important to my path in the alternative health world, and this will bring us to why we are talking about this when we're supposed to be talking about autoimmunity. Back in my little town, that girl and I had broken up, and I was in a sort of despair in an empty apartment in an end-of-the-road type of town that I had no roots in, and I didn't know what I was going to do next. I don't remember if he called me or I called him, but I remember standing there in my empty living room, looking out across that nice little river and at the ominous cell phone tower, as Mike told me bluntly, I'm out of this place, man. I can't take all the hassle out here in East Toronto. All the traffic. All the stress. He said he was moving to Windsor, Ontario, a small industrial city across the river from Detroit, Michigan. His daughter lived there and he had a location picked out to open a store under the same guise as his booth in the flea market. He didn't ask if I wanted to join. He didn't know my situation, but my lease was coming up and I didn't want to pay for the place anyways. I told him I'd pack up and go with him. At this point, I still didn't really know anything about electromagnetic frequencies, EMF, and I really didn't know much about the magic discs either. I was still rooted in nutrition, and I was there to help him sell all the different things he had, including our supplements. Since I had really only seen his demonstration once when he did it on me, I hadn't had much exposure, and since I wasn't there long, I hadn't really heard the entire pitch. When we met, we mostly talked business or talked shop. We had even been on the radio together at some point along here, and we still hadn't heard each other out entirely. But now I got to hear the entire sales process, and I had a lot of questions. Mike kept mentioning testimonials for health problems that I was taught were entirely nutritional. My head was already spinning about this, and I had already begun going through a bunch of books on radiation to catch myself up, when one day at work Mike mentioned one of his testimonials about lupus. I really had to step back and sit down. Most of the claims he was making were about physical problems, and I still had a lot of questions about that, but the symptoms of lupus are mostly digestive, blood sugar, circulatory, and a low-grade allergic type of experience in the body. Inflammation all over, basically. The guy he was talking about was on video giving his testimonial, but as usual, Mike said his real off-camera testimony is even more amazing. Long story short, he felt a lot better extremely quickly, credited to a frequency tuning disc, but this is lupus. I didn't understand. Mike is more of a mechanic than a technician, so he wasn't really able to explain it either but he was able to tell me that he has other similar cases, so-called autoimmune patients who felt much better in many ways very quickly with the addition of the magic discs. As I dug into this one case, trying to justify an explanation as to how this person could achieve this result with an anti-radiation device, I had a few realizations. The first usual suspect is placebo. It really is an awesome healing tool, but this seemed too dramatic. The guy was very overweight, very obviously experiencing serious digestive issues and circulation issues. His cheeks were red with spider web patterns, typical of lupus. He looked like he was having a low-grade allergic reaction, typical of lupus, and he reported that this was constant for him, as expected. I have to reserve the power of belief as a factor in any major transformation, and I expect that strong hope that something will work and a desire for it to work 
will greatly enhance the benefit they experience. But I was not willing to credit belief with this transformation. I had been around just enough to have dealt with a few autoimmune people by that point. I knew they were tough cases. They had to change their eating habits, they had to put in a bunch of nutrients, and this had to take time. Cells don't regenerate overnight. Healing and digestive strategies take time. It just shouldn't be possible to turn this around in minutes like they were all claiming. When I first met Mike back at the flea market, the first real question he asked me was if I had any pain. This was part of his process. Often, the person did have a pain, and they could point to at least one. Mike's strategy was to attach a disc to that spot immediately, and then carry on with answering their questions about his live pain free banner, and he would be moving towards doing the demonstration as well. He did this because he knew it was likely that the pain would disappear in the time they were talking. He would bet that in the few minutes he had with the average person, that in that time he could eliminate at least one pain. This is an amazing thing when you think about it. We are not taught about this type of thing in nutrition. In nutrition, I expect results, but not immediately. In a few minutes, I can barely expect to make a proposal and a transaction, let alone a result. They have to take action and continue for the expected, feel better part of the deal. If there was a five minute method, it felt like we were wrong about nutrition. There was an explanation right in front of me. It was in the books and it was in my life. I knew people who did live blood analysis. They look at blood in real time, live. I knew that blood could crinkle up and clump together under many forms of stress. It suddenly made sense. All this nutrient stuff I was taught about was transported in the blood. Digestive problems could cause blood problems. We call this dirty blood or sticky blood. This is basically leaky gut, undigested food particles getting into the blood via the intestines. The blood correctly responds to these foreign food particles, supposed to have been broken down further and chemically altered in the digestive process before being absorbed. The blood clots attention around these undigested food particles and this causes an overall congestion problem in the blood. Like white blood cells attacking a sickness, the bodies of cells and pathogens add up to a mucus we call dirty blood. It is almost like an allergic reaction, or the body responding to a virus. That's one way to have compromised blood. Another is to have a nutrient deficiency severe enough to affect the blood. The body will take nutrients from virtually every system in the body before it messes with the blood. A problem in the blood is a huge problem. If there's not enough of the right stuff for the blood to function properly, the body will fail catastrophically. Every blood deficiency has a disease named after it. But even under good conditions, when there is no digestive problem, no dirty blood problem, and the person is supplementing with all of the essential nutrients in optimum amounts, we can still see in live blood analysis that healthy blood can crumple up, stick together, slow down, and look visibly terrible compared to healthy blood relieved of the stress. This was it. That is the answer. If radiation can affect the blood, and we know it does because live blood analysis shows this, then all of the nutrients, oxygen, sugar, and waste products that the blood needs to transport around can be compromised by this. Electronic devices have increased in use to the point where everyone has something on them or near them sending signals and attempting to receive them. The fields are invisible but they are all around us. Voltage traveling through wires has increased significantly over the decades. All of this is a more stressful environment for us to operate in. It affects our blood cells, and they are responsible for transporting every other important thing you could name in and out of the body. If someone's blood is fully impacted by this radiation stress, then relieving that stress alone can show a near miraculous result very quickly. The discs aren't magic, they have a mechanical explanation, but I wasn't satisfied with the explanation Mike gave for the relief of symptoms. He said the discs were charged with frequencies, the same frequencies as our bones, nervous system, and muscular system. This is assumed to enhance our own energy fields, protecting against harmful ones. He had some lines memorized by Nikola Tesla about frequencies, and he focused on the demonstrations and whether someone stopped shaking or felt pain relief as the conversation happened. I also saw him bet, many times, that letting someone take a sample bracelet home for the night would bring them back for a purchase. Not only did most of them come back and return the sample, most of them also bought a better bracelet. Many of them remained highly skeptical, but continued to wear the discs. I was used to standing beside doctors and professionals and talking seriously about health with people who are in serious condition. I'm used to having solid mechanical answers for them. I was not comfortable pitching magic discs that relieve pain just because of magic energy, but now I had a mechanical explanation. I stayed in that town long enough to see many hundreds of demonstrations, witness and meet many testimonials, and do many demonstrations myself. Many people tried to fool the discs, but they couldn't. They work under a steel toe boot, they work if you slip it into someone's pocket and don't tell them, they work on dogs and cats having mobility trouble in old age, 
I don't think a dog has any expectation or placebo response to a frequency tuning disc. If they had serious trouble going up the stairs or had lost that ability and then can quite suddenly go up them with ease, something has changed. Dogs, like people, require time to heal injuries and rebuild tissues, but they can also be impacted by the radiation in our homes in our modern world. The point of this long divergence is that my time in this part of the alternative health business, the anti-radiation world, gave me everything I felt I needed to finally understand health problems in our society and what to do about them. In my time with the discs, I have heard and seen things I know make us sound like liars for saying. I have seen people stand up from wheelchairs who were nearly completely immobile moments before. I have met people who walked into our store with crutches and walked out on their own two feet. We have had people with many varieties of cancers and autoimmune diseases report incredible turnarounds. Most of these people did not buy our nutrition products. Most of them did not change their lifestyles. These are regular people. It's a lot easier to sell a magic bracelet than it is a healthy lifestyle. At this point I will mention what I think the difference between cancer and autoimmune problems is. As far as I can tell, cancer is what happens when a catastrophically compromised body fails big time in one system in the body. The liver is dying, they call it liver cancer. The skin is messed up, they call it skin cancer. It's a growth in the brain, it's brain cancer. Growth in the prostate, prostate cancer. We've seen many things that can contribute to system failures. Digestive problems can lead to nutrient deficiencies and dirty blood and blood sugar problems and circulation problems. Nutrient deficiencies can exist without a digestive problem just by not having enough nutrients in the diet. Those nutrients are responsible for every system in the body, so if there's not enough, there's a problem. Selenium also happens to be one of those key nutrients involved in both the liver and prostate, by the way. No coincidence. We've seen that stress of all kinds can impact the basic ability of the body to maintain and repair itself, and we've added electronic frequencies to that list. So when it happens in an identifiable system and the allopathic professionals don't have an explanation, they call it a cancer. When the body is failing in multiple systems, I believe they call it autoimmune. Now, there is a complicated aspect here having to do with antibodies. We are going to talk more about blood markers, which is what I prefer to call them, in the next section on AIDS. For now, it is worth pointing out that there is no agreed explanation about autoimmunity in the mainstream medical world. They say blood marker antibodies have something to do with it, but not one of their so-called autoimmune diseases have a consistent correlation between the presence of antibodies and the presence of symptoms. This means that some people who have symptoms called an autoimmune disease don't have the appropriate expected blood markers, and some people without symptoms have these markers. To me, this means there is not a correlation but this is what tests for these diseases are about. We don't need a test to see that autoimmune people have a problem. By our questionnaire or by looking at them, we can easily see multiple problems in the body. End note 14. We are not allowed to diagnose people with a disease, but we can ask them about their existing health problems. Some of these questions can change our recommendations, such as a missing gallbladder or the presence of a stomach acid lowering drug or shellfish allergy. I have made content describing the process of asking and answering these questions on our YouTube channel, Wallach's Warriors, and my podcast, Notice and Friends. Here is the questionnaire we are currently using. Age, height, weight, sex, country, all symptoms, all diagnosis, have they had any surgeries, any organs or glands removed, are they on any chemical drugs, do they take any supplements, do they take any herbs or natural medicines, do they avoid any foods, do they have any sensitivities? Do they have any allergies? Do they have any skin, lung, or digestive issues? Do they know their blood type? Do they have any sleeping problems, teeth grinding or sweating at night, nightmares? Were they born C-sectioned? Are they pregnant or nursing or trying? Do they drink anything carbonated? Do they drink coffee or energy drinks? Optional. Show us a picture of their finger or toenails, not polished. What is their favorite food? anything else we should know about. Most of these questions can be expected on a form from a dentist office the first time you want to use their services. They do need some basics to handle you properly. We can't prescribe drugs, but we should know if you're on any. Return to text. In my experience, there is always a bad food involved. Always. There is always a food causing an inflammatory reaction. Even the guy who got the great result quickly was still eating the wrong foods and will still have the corresponding health problems. At least he feels better. If a body is failing, there is always a nutrient deficiency involved. The body needs nutrients to heal. If it feels bad, it most likely needs more nutrients. Chances are, the person with an autoimmune disease is on a pharmaceutical drug. 
The way these drugs are marketed, they say these drugs suppress the immune system, under the assumption that the immune system is attacking itself. We do not believe the immune system attacks itself. We believe there is likely many separate problems going on in the body. Food is probably one. Nutrient deficiency is definitely one. EMF stress can most definitely be another. Our intention is to support the immune system, rather than oppress it. If the body can heal itself, we want to support that. I took this tangent because we were in the middle of listing everything I would do if I found out I had cancer. I would get strict on my eating, get serious on my supplementing, I would encourage circulation and low impact exercise, and seek a lot of rest and relaxation. But I would also get serious about reducing the radiation around me. I would wear a frequency tuning disc bracelet. Unlike nutrition, which must be consumed every day more or less, a device can be purchased once and they can be collected. I wear one on the wrist and I wear one on the ankle and I don't think I'm going to stop that. I've also now lived far from cities. I've been out in the desert with my shoes off grounded to the earth, I've taken the bracelet off and still felt weaker without it, so I do believe it has an enhancement effect on its own. And I do believe that it is one of the things we should definitely do to reduce the stress of EMF on our body. That's only one device but it's the cheapest one that actually works, in my experience. There are a few key things that can reduce our exposure. The biggest source for most people these days will be the phone in their hand or pocket. There are devices that can reduce the fields of the phone. I use one, and I don't like to use devices without one. End note 15. I sell a few anti-EMF devices, including that patch. www.wallexwarriors.ca Return to text. The cheap ones on the market don't work well enough, or at all, in my opinion. I don't put the phone in my pocket, basically ever, maybe 10 minutes in a year, the odd time I have my hands full. The phone never goes to my head. I speak with headphones attached to a wire or on speakerphone. I also don't pay a phone bill, so airplane mode can always be on. Everyone I know and do business with can contact me through a number of apps, but not by phone number. This is not for everyone, I guess, but I find it great. I pay for home internet by a cable, I use Wi-Fi, and I do everything on Wi-Fi or my wire-connected computer. When I go outside, I have peace. The data signal on my phone can be turned off all the time. The Bluetooth is off. It's the best I can do for now. But I run a business online and I do travel and I have operated without a phone bill for several years now, so I encourage it. Wi-Fi is also EMF, but it's not as bad as having it in your pocket or at your temple. You can make or buy a Faraday cage that will reduce the output of the router. In many cases, you can get a smaller router and it will work fine. You can shield some of the bigger sources with any type of metal plate or foil. Yes, foil. Don't seal off the whole house, and you don't need to wear it on your head, though it would offer some protection. Many people are making silver fabric clothing, including hats, for this reason. They also make EMF shielding paint with metal in it. In my house, I foiled the wall behind the smart meter and put a bookshelf in front of that. The refrigerator will be one of the larger sources in the house. If your favorite chair shares a wall with the fridge, I'd shield that wall. If I live next to a cell phone tower, an electrical transfer station, high voltage power lines, or above a subway, I would move. There isn't a way to completely shield yourself from extremely strong sources close by. This is pretty much the last major category of the alternative health world. Energy, frequencies, and self-healing in the countryside. The people I had heard who had chronic illness or a serious diagnosis and basically went home to die, typically left the city and went home to a country, away from much of the radiation. The extended fishing trip is away from all the electro stress in the atmosphere, the constant buzz. The meditation trip is peaceful in part because of this. The singing bowls and tuning forks and grounding blankets, if they help, I would say it was because those frequencies helped relieve some of the ongoing EMF stress temporarily. I am also willing to connect juicing to this. I've already mentioned a few reasons why juicing might help someone feel better, but here is two steps deeper. Minerals are inorganic in most of the world. That means they're rocks, or sand, or shells. In seawater, all the minerals are present in trace amounts, but not in organic form. When a plant absorbs a mineral, it converts the inorganic mineral into a charged electrical form, sometimes called ionic or colloidal. We call them colloidal and promote them with this explanation. In soils, this process requires fungus in the soil to participate in the acceptance into the root of the plant. End note 16. Pesticides and herbicides and fungicides can nullify much of this process. As a result, plants grown in non-organic agriculture will have less minerals and less overall nutritional value per carbohydrate. The BRIC score is commonly used to measure the nutritional value of fruits and vegetables and berries. BRIC scores are invariably lower with non-organic crops and invariably higher with additional colloidal minerals added. This can be experimented in any garden. 
We sell the raw form of our human mineral supplement as garden fertilizer. You might find this interesting. In the agricultural world, you can't pitch a farmer that he will increase his yields by more than 50%. You will sound like a lunatic to the farmer, and he will not take you serious. They already have very impressive yields in modern agriculture with standard fertilizers focusing on nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, NPK. So we are taught not to attempt to sell our plant-derived mineral fertilizers with the numbers we are actually able to produce. We can achieve much more than 50% yield improvement on probably every crop imaginable. Return to text. These are my simple words for a very complicated process. Seawater is full of microorganisms already, and they also facilitate the process in sea plants. These colloidal minerals are interesting, and I'm going to hover here for a moment. If you take a handful of sand or dirt or any inorganic minerals and you add them to water, they will sink to the bottom after some time. If you shake it all up, it will become cloudy, and then eventually it will settle again. Colloidal minerals have many interesting properties, but the most interesting to me is that colloidal minerals do not settle. The explanation is that they are charged, ionic, and so they remain in suspension indefinitely because they remain repelled from each other electrically. Fascinating, really. It is like perpetual motion, or magnetism. Like a refrigerator magnet staying stuck perpetually, the particles remain there charged, apparently forever. I mentioned magic earlier. Well, this is the real magic as far as I'm concerned. Not only are organic colloidal mineral particles much smaller than inorganic forms, the plant-derived colloidal mineral forms seem to be required for optimal structure and function and longevity, while inorganic minerals are difficult to absorb and many of them can be harmful. Arsenic is an agreed-upon essential mineral for all vertebrates, all animals with a spine, but it can kill in the inorganic form. Same story with pretty much every element on the list. It can be essential, and it can kill you in the wrong form or dose. So plants, through plant magic, convert the earth into an interesting electrical form of energetic nutrition. And that's interesting. But they also change the structure of the water. Structured water is another huge topic that deserves detail but must be included briefly because this is a long list. In my attempt to give a proper summary of the many options available for getting closer to health, structured water has to be mentioned. Clean water is important, but structure seems to be much more important. In nature, stagnant water is bad. We don't want to drink it. We have to do something with it. Boil it, maybe capture the steam, maybe add salt or other things like medicinal tea leaves in the hopes of avoiding plagues that can come from bad water. Running water is much cleaner. Water running over rocks creates vortex patterns, spirals, which seem to clean and structure the water. Ocean water also has its own structure. This is the structure we use for the product I am most familiar with. There are spiral taps sold as water structure devices. I believe they do help. I believe the water is better if it runs through a vortex before you consume it. There are also receptacles marketed to be shaped so as to not allow the water to settle, encouraging a healthier structure. I do know all of this can sound loony, which is why I included it all in this weird chapter. I'll give one more thought on this before we get back to juicing. At one point in my life I worked in a chemistry lab analyzing seawater samples. There can be many steps involved in preparing samples, adding reactive agents, reagents, letting them sit on timers, heating them or cooling them, etc. Some tests require that you spin the sample in a vortex. Measuring chlorophyll, for example, each sample had to be spun on a vortex or it would screw up the results. It would measure low. I thought that was very interesting at the time, but I didn't really get it. Since then, I started stirring whatever I was drinking in a quick vortex before I drank it. It seems to change the taste of almost anything you drink if you pay attention to it. So why is juicing so effective? On top of being an easy to digest, nutritionally dense drink that is easy to add even more supplements to, it is typically spun in a vortex before serving, but even better is the fact that the water was already structured inside of the plant. Plant juice is structured water. Celery juicing every day for 90 days is one of the most popular alternative health trends of our current time. This is structured water. We can't eat enough plants to really get this benefit. Most of the liquid we would be consuming throughout the day will be from a tap or bottle or something other than a plant. It takes a lot of oranges to make a glass of orange juice. But that is structured water. We are mostly water. Water is a necessary cofactor for most or all processes in the body. Water is the substrate in which all the chemical processes in the body take place. In the health business, there's a saying to sell water filters. If you don't have a water filter, you are the filter. Wow. It sold me. Filter for life. So clean water is important. The structure of water is important. We are mostly water, and structured water seems to be good for us. Since we are mostly water, this is most of our energy field, if I have come far enough to use language like this. When we enhance our own water system with properly structured water, we are enhanced dramatically. And I mean really dramatically. I mean a structured water program can rebound someone's health just as well as any other miracle I've witnessed. 
and juicing is one way to do it. It's an expensive way to do it, but nonetheless. This is protection from stress to our own energy field, signified by the blood. This is witnessed by live blood analysis. Many structured water products use live blood analysis to pitch their water. The blood can be seen to be relieved. To wrap up this segment, I want to be clear that I am not saying radiation is the cause of autoimmune diseases. We covered rheumatoid arthritis already, the oddball in the arthritis group and in the autoimmune group. Our explanation is that the rheumatoid component is caused by a bug infection. The arthritis part is partially damage from the bug and degeneration from nutrient deficiency. The other autoimmune diseases are not as clear as this. They're not clear at all. The antibody explanation isn't clear at all. The mainstream treatments are not successful at all. The drugs they prescribe can do serious damage or kill. After years of trying to find out how antibodies are actually correlated with disease and what they actually are, I am convinced that I do not understand antibodies. I have given up because I am also convinced that no one else understands them either. But I know for certain that everyone being told they have an autoimmune problem has many problems. One could be more of a problem than others. I have heard so many people claim total transformation just by quitting gluten or grains altogether, I cannot count them all. It could just be gluten, it could just be catastrophic nutrient deficiency, it could be hyper-stress from life, hypersensitivity to radiation stress. More likely is a combination of most or all of these things. Maybe other stresses too. Maybe the cat wakes them up every night in the middle of the night and they haven't slept through the night in years as a result. Maybe the kids are troublemakers and they're losing their hair from all of that on top of everything. In the public market we hear about all kinds of stresses. An ongoing infection problem could be a big factor that was overlooked. A fungal infection of some form is likely in everyone I've ever seen with an autoimmune problem other than rheumatoid. But even with rheumatoid, many of them are likely to have a fungal infection problem as well. An immune problem encourages growth of all the bad stuff. All of these stresses can contribute, and relieving any one of them could feel like a magic bullet for the person experiencing the relief. We recommend approaching health generally. We don't treat autoimmunity because, well, we don't even believe the term makes sense. But we also don't even need to target the problem. We need to use every strategy we can to promote a healthy body. Eliminating the bad stuff, adding the good stuff at appropriate doses, and recognizing that electrical frequencies could be interfering with all of it by design of modern life. This will be my last point on the matter before moving on to the last chapters. There is more we can do to promote relief from radiation stress, and they are also healing techniques on their own. For centuries, people have left the cities on healing trips to the countryside. There have always been many theories on why this could be beneficial. When people went out to the country, they tended to go to a cottage, or a manor, or a mountain, or a beach. Any of these gets us away from the stress of the city, but some of these we believe to be healing in themselves. The beach is full of negative ions. It is said that the bad energy associated with EMF is positive ions. So negative beats positive. I think they should have named them the other way around, but hey. The air around the ocean and beach are said to be loaded with these negative ions, combating the bad ions or enhancing us or however we choose to describe it. I don't think we really need to understand it. The beach has good energy, so that appears to promote rest, relaxation, and healing. Running water has good energy, and that appears to encourage good health as well. Salt lamps, said to reduce EMF stress in the home, also stream negative ions into the air. I find them highly beneficial. Mountains are big rocks. Rocks have good energy. I live in a place called the Canadian Shield. It's a gigantic rock. You put the shovel in the ground, and very soon you hit rock. And it stretches down to parts of America as well. The energy side of the alternative health world is much closer to the hippie end of things than I am used to in the nutrition end. We really are talking about energy and rocks here, but I'm serious about it. We also talk as if the cells of trees act like frequency tuning discs charged with good energy. When I first came way up north, I couldn't understand why I got so tired in the forest. On this gigantic rock, surrounded by trees in every direction, I felt like I was being waved to sleep. I wanted to sleep all day. This is very unusual for me. I believe this is healing energy, and I believe it is necessary to know about. It is a much healthier environment, nature stuff, as far as I can tell, than any indoor therapeutic environment. Nature can heal, I believe. The body asking for sleep is doing it for a reason. To become excessively relaxed and tired in the middle of the day is probably the result of something therapeutic. If you look, you will find many people who embraced a natural lifestyle in as many different ways as possible. Something as little as spending time with feet grounded on the earth can go a long way. Implementing awareness of electrical pollution can go a long way. Trips out to nature can be phenomenally restorative. I didn't want to reiterate the fake diseases theory here because I think you get it by this point. None of the so-called autoimmune diseases can really be diseases if they are the result of mechanical problems in the body. 
Though there is a reasonably long list of possible mechanical problems, we have covered most of them. Doctors get away with labeling autoimmune problems as diseases because they seem to want to treat them, but they don't know how to. Helping a person get better from any of the symptoms on the list of the average autoimmune problem has nothing to do with the toolkit of the allopathic professional. There is nothing to cut out when it comes to an autoimmune problem. There are no useful surgical interventions. There are no drugs that support and promote the body's natural ability to heal itself. And some of the foods on the food plate, we're saying, can screw up the body big time, enough to look like an autoimmune disease. It is up to us who we take our health problems to. Knowing all of this, I wouldn't go to a medical doctor if I had this type of problem, and I wouldn't bother calling it a disease. It is not transmitted, it is multidimensional, and none of the routes to relief are medicinal. Maybe a medicine can help them, but it's not a cure. If syphilis is a disease because it requires treatment by a licensed practitioner, then autoimmune problems, cancer, digestive disorders, blood sugar problems, bone and joint problems, and birth defects should not be called diseases. Knowing all of this, we can tackle the final topics. Chapter 9. AIDS. Initially, I wanted to start this book with AIDS. AIDS is, I think, the best true example of a fake disease. I have used the word fake kind of loosely in this book. Most of the stuff we've covered is absolutely real. Birth defects are real, bone, blood sugar, and digestive problems are real. Cancer and autoimmune diseases, while poorly defined, are still experiences that require a name. My problem so far has mostly just been that many things shouldn't be called diseases. The title of a disease is mostly misleading. The legal appropriation of the word disease is necessary to properly categorize things that require treatment from regulated professionals. Most of our list does not meet this criteria, and so should not be thought of as disease. Most of what we have talked about can be easily prevented and reversed. That's important and empowering. But how do we protect ourselves from a fake disease? Syphilis is a disease because it requires treatment. Technically it's an infection, but legally it's a disease. I prefer to use the correct technical language to describe specific things. A spade is most usefully referred to as a spade, and an infection is most usefully referred to as an infection. I'm totally okay with syphilis being classified as a disease. All infections should fall under the legal umbrella of professions equipped to deal with infections. The market should be protected from false claims about real diseases. This is a big part of the point in the legal terminology. Classifying something as a disease not only determines who can treat it, but also what we can all say about it. None of us can go on TV and talk directly about a cure for cancer. With the mainstream understanding of cancer, or the one we have covered here, it is not appropriate to talk this way, and this is legally important in the modern world. I believe in the free market and that people should be able to make their own informed decisions, but if we do have medical regulations, they might as well be used to set the appropriate boundaries for talking about medical things. This isn't censorship as much as it is agreeing what words mean. Agreeing what words mean is part of the foundation of law. Disease, treatment, and cure are serious legal words. If disease can mean any health issue, we will have a problem unless we are equipped to deal with health issues. If health issues must be treated, we must go to a doctor. If a doctor can't help, we still have an issue. If they make it worse, you get the idea. So that's my problem with calling chronic illness, chronic pain, birth defects, and body failure disease. My bigger problem is in completely made up diseases. Syphilis is an infection. It infects us, we show symptoms, we take drug, drug kills bug, infection is over. Infections can be cured. AIDS is supposedly caused by an infection with HIV. They say there are two strains of lentivirus that can cause this. If the supposedly HIV infected person gets worse, beyond the arbitrary limit, they now say they have AIDS. So AIDS is the name for the HIV patient in poor condition. Syphilis is killed with a drug, but the H viruses are not. Antiviral pharmaceuticals have terribly unpredictable results with the H's. There are a lot of people out there now claiming that terrain theory explains all viruses. I think they have a lot of good points. Viruses are all around us, inside of us, everywhere all the time. Bacteria and other potentially dangerous pathogens are also around us all the time. The only major difference is bacteria, fungus, worms, and so on all have cells, while viruses apparently do not. It is quite easy to know that we have been infected by a bug. It turns out to be quite a bit more difficult to prove an infection by a virus. It is even more difficult to prove beyond confusion that a therapy actually works against a virus. The single most effective treatment for virus infection is grandma's recipe. Rest, heat, liquids, and time. I feel like keeping the quotations around infection when talking about viruses because it does not seem to be clear that AIDS is actually an infection. The same problem exists for antibodies. I have many problems with the way testing is done in the first place. 
The guy who invented the PCR test, Kerry Mullis, also publicly doubted the efficacy of the test in use for disease diagnosis. Nevertheless, even if the tests were 100% accurate, we still have many leftover questions about the unpredictability of markers. People can still carry blood markers long after any sign of an infection with an H virus has vanished. This is not the case with bacterial infections. If you beat a bug, it's gone. But an infection with an H virus seems to be able to affect us forever. Most people infected with any virus, usually a flu of some kind, tend to get better, regardless of the course of action, with time. If time passes, they are likely to get better, with or without medicine. Most honest doctors will answer about viruses the same way we do. If you've already got symptoms, there's not much you can do. It has to pass. Very few compounds will speed up this process. We can support the body's ability to defend itself and give it more nutrition. This might ease our misery, but the sickness will still need time to clear, usually around two weeks, more or less. Kids, adults, elderly, all need time. This is not true for syphilis. If you leave it, you will get worse and worse until it becomes life-threatening. If you still do nothing, you will die. A blood sugar problem will not go away by accident. Something needs to change. Aches and pains and rashes can come and go, but chances are the frequency of appearance will not change much unless the lifestyle is changed. By this one factor, time, we see that viral infections are different in at least one important way from all of the other diseases we have seen. No matter what the PCR test says, if we give it time, we are not likely to suffer long term. It's a bit weird to think of it this way, because AIDS is only promoted with fear. But all symptoms related to viruses do seem to pass if they don't kill us. I'm very doubtful that viruses, at least retroviruses, infect us in anything close to the same way as a bacteria or worm or fungus. We are told that viruses use our cells to host their DNA, but everywhere else we look on Earth we see viruses. Animals can fail rapidly like humans under bad conditions. They can appear to be suffering from viral type illness too. But the terrain theory holds that this possibility is always there. If we become too far from healthy, we are susceptible to begin looking diseased. It's not easy to prove a negative, but they have also sold us this disease without proper proof, in my opinion. The test they used to look for markers of this disease is questioned by many of the people involved with creating it, including the main guy who got the Nobel for it. I expect that he understands the test better than I do, and he says it's bogus, in my translation. The controversies behind PCR and false positives could be a book itself, but to have a disease on a spectrum based on markers that are only found by a dodgy test does not give me the confidence to call this a disease or an infection at all. The word spectrum is important. Syphilis is not a spectrum. You have it or you do not have it. No in-between. No partial syphilis. No, just a little bit of syphilis. No, you still have the syphilis but your markers are low. None of this would make sense for syphilis because syphilis is an infection. What kind of infection operates on a spectrum? Excellent question. A fake infection is my answer. The huge majority of adults in the western world will have PCR blood markers for herpes. They call this HSV. In my opinion, all the H's are the same in that they are not infections. If the word infection is used to describe syphilis, then it cannot be used to describe any of the H retroviruses. The HIV, HSV, HPV so-called infections do not match the appearance of other viral infections. The majority of adults in the western world supposedly have markers for herpes in their blood, but the majority of adults in the western world do not show symptoms of herpes. HSV is the name below an arbitrary threshold, and herpes is what it's called when there's symptoms. Symptoms tend to occur when there are more markers in the blood, so herpes is to HSV what AIDS is to HIV. Even the mainstream medical world seems to believe that you have to be unhealthy for any symptoms to appear. So are the symptoms a result of an infection or the result of an unhealthy body? It seems quite clear that this is a result of an unhealthy body. Terrain theory. Don't believe me? First, go get a test for herpes. It's a safe bet that you'll have antibodies. If not, you will be able to find someone you know easily. If we tested the whole population, I bet a majority will have antibodies. If you do not have cold sores or have never gotten one, all you have to do is the opposite of everything we've mentioned to promote good health. If it's healthy to rest, relax, avoid stress, avoid bad foods, and take nutrients, then it's just as easy to do the opposite to promote the opposite of health. Be stressed. Don't sleep. Eat only junk food. Take drugs. Don't supplement. Not even vitamin C. You will develop cold sores or something similar very quickly. You will get sick, likely. You likely develop growths all over the body in some form. Some of them could look like pimples, others like warts, 
You might even develop genital warts, whether you've ever had sexual contact or not. Cysts are likely. Rashes and fungal infections are likely. Respiratory infections are likely. Aches and pains and various discomforts will appear in short time. I don't believe that you need to have sexual contact to develop symptoms of herpes or the other H's. I believe all you need to do to show any of these symptoms is to be unhealthy. The more unhealthy, the more likely all the so-called H viral symptoms will appear. If you have symptoms, the whole list of things to do to promote health applies. The protocol from the allopaths is drugs that attack the immune system. We do not believe that this is a good idea. There are many ways to support the immune system. I didn't mention extra zinc when talking about cancer, so I'll throw that in. It's another one of the essential nutrients that is also an antioxidant and also supports and promotes a healthy immune system. These are legally granted claims, so if I had a diagnosis of an immune problem of any kind, including any virus, I would boost all of the antioxidant nutrients on top of the list. Many people survive a long time with HIV. I have an uncle who has had it as long as I've been alive. He's not in amazing shape, but he's alive. He looks like any other civilian on the street, in my opinion. Magic Johnson, once a poster boy of AIDS, is still alive. Magic Johnson for years has publicly endorsed various products that are said to support the immune system. Digging in a bit deeper, there are more sinister problems. The idea that many of the phony diseases came originally from animals seems usually to be media nonsense. I'd recommend not listening to anything about health on TV. Even if you see me on TV, the edit is probably bogus. That wouldn't be a problem, except that humans tend to get the blame for the animal infection. In the case of AIDS, one man was publicly thought of as patient zero. This vilification apparently harmed his life in a great way. I believe it. We want to place blame on this thing this noun. And if it is not a noun, a thing that can infect us, then this scam has hurt many people unnecessarily. Certain groups were identified as being more susceptible to AIDS. Let's have a closer look. Gay men were singled out for two reasons. The first is anal sex. Rectal tissues are more easily damaged than vaginal tissues. The rectum does not secrete its own lubrication. The vagina does. Anal sex is more likely to tear skin than vaginal sex. Open wounds are susceptible to infections. Skin protects from infections. Both parties are liable to tear skin if inadequately lubricated, and this is a natural risk with anal sex. Obviously, the rectal cavity, if pierced, is at a high risk of infection. That's one reason. They singled out gay men because gay men are more likely to practice anal sex. I think it's useful to teach safe practices for straight people too, by the way. But gay men were at risk, so they were a lot of the focus. The second reason they were singled out was because of party culture overlapping with gay male populations. They tended to party and do drugs, especially amphetamine drugs that are known to be bad for the immune system. So they were also at a high risk because of this. Drug users in general were also high risk, and gay men were known to overlap with that group quite a bit. There's a few problems here. First of all, AIDS is a relatively new disease. Anal sex is not. It is as old as writing, as far as we know. Anal sex is inscribed on ancient tablets and depicted in ancient statues and carvings, so there has always been a direct risk of infection present. The risk is not new. Disinfection is also not new. There are a long list of plants and other antimicrobial things like shell flour, essential oils, and fire that the ancients knew about and most likely utilized to help deal with infections. They say the Incas were doing brain surgery. I have to believe they knew about infections. I have worked in one remote location with no direct access to emergency medical care. It is a small village on the Pacific coast of Costa Rica. The entire Pacific Nicoya Peninsula is known as a blue zone, but that's another book. Most of the village does not speak English at all. Last count, two of the younger villagers were sent out to college. One of them learned massage therapy, a useful trade for the healthy tourist industry in the country, paid for with the father's football money. The father now gets free massages, and he already lives in one of the world's longest lived locations, and I think he's a pretty smart guy. The jungle is known as a rough place for infections, and it's true. Fungus, bugs, birds, and all kinds of animals will steal your garden if you're not careful. Fungal infections in the body are likely if dampness is not kept in check, and spooky viruses are said to be ever-present. You might think that a people who have survived in an infection-prone environment for many generations would have many treatments for viruses. They don't. If you get hurt in the jungle, the remedy is usually seawater. One of our students once stepped on a stingray. It punctured her foot. It was painful, but not threatening. She chose to stay in town, rather than venture the dirt roads many hours to a dodgy hospital. Locals assured us the hospital didn't have much for her anyway. She wasn't losing a lot of blood, and it was all wrapped up, but of course there is a risk of infection, our primary concern at this point. The local remedy? Seawater. The foot stays in the seawater, it heals faster. It feels better, 
and it is less likely to get infected. Change the water frequently. Once I had to crawl under a wooden deck to turn on a water main. I got many bullet ant stings. The local remedy was salt water. Until 2015, I had only heard of one case of dengue fever in the area. Dengue is said to be a virus transmitted by mosquito. There are always a lot of mosquitoes in these hot, damp places, which is part of the reason these places are known for many viruses. I do believe mosquitoes can make us sick. That case was a student from a western country in a village down the road. She was not healthy generally, from what I was told. Her immune system was highly susceptible to infection, in my opinion. But in 2015, something weird happened. A bunch of people got dengue. Dengue in the tropics, they say, gets you once, like chicken pox. And many people had already experienced it at some point in their lives. Dengue is miserable, like flu in paralysis, wretchedly tired but unable to sleep, sweating hot, freezing cold. The mandatory fan blowing on you to keep the mosquitoes away feels more like needles. This can last a few days or a week or more. The worst part of the experience was hydrophobia. Very few other illnesses include hydrophobia, an intense repulsion to water. Rabies also has hydrophobia included in its symptoms. So dengue is like rabies with the flu in paralysis. I'm just painting a picture here for you because we're talking about infections still. AIDS is still said to be an infection, but this is the kind of story I'm looking for when it comes to an infection. So in 2015, nearly everyone in the village got what appeared to be dengue. They all called it dengue because it felt like dengue to them. The village was getting quiet because everyone was at home in bed. You can't even pretend to go about your business with dengue. We were getting pretty worried that we were going to get it too. Then there was a power outage that lasted longer than a normal rolling blackout. Long enough for the mosquitoes to really get us, without the fans on. Glass windows are a luxury in the jungle, and so most people do not have them. I remember it like it was yesterday. It was New Year's Eve, and we were invited to a celebration at the Don's house. A Don is like an unofficial mayor. I was honored, frankly. But as we were getting ready, it hit me like a brick. I couldn't even really speak to my friends. I just crawled into bed and curled up, and stayed there for days. We developed symptoms a few days apart, so we could help each other. We forced each other to eat, at least a little bit of egg or fish, and drink water and supplements. Saliva wasn't being produced, and chewing was very difficult. Like some chemical drugs, eating carbs or plant material is almost impossible. You can keep chewing and it doesn't seem to go anywhere. There is a real risk of choking. We also forced each other to shower and go into the ocean. Actually, we were already used to having our daily meetings in the ocean. We can get a short bit of vitamin D from the sun, a bit of a swim which is a nice luxury, and we can talk to each other without any distractions or devices. If I'm in charge of the time, I like to get a little bit of extra value for the money. With dengue, the beach and the water and the sun were all horrible. Painful even. If you can believe it, hydrophobia makes water disgusting. And we need water. Showering was miserable. Of course we don't have hot water anyway. One of my friends begged us to get him a helicopter airlift back to America or something. Anything. Anywhere. Anyone who could help. Many people beg God for it to stop or for a merciful death. I'm being dramatic because infections are dramatic. The local remedy, you can probably guess. Rest, try to nourish, salty water, and that's pretty much it. There is no shaman, voodoo, herb, or root that will ease the suffering noticeably. There were obvious differences in how people dealt with the problem. Everyone did a lot of resting as the primary treatment, but young people clearly got over it faster. None of us lasted longer than a week. Some old people lasted too. Of the three of us, one was in great shape. He built himself a jungle gym and he forced himself to train weights and cardio during the dengue. I couldn't believe it even as I watched him. He looked like a zombie. It looked like torture, but he did it. And he forced the beach trip, which was really a five minute walk but seemed to take all day on dengue. He did it every day while we took a couple days off. He got better faster than either of us. Much faster. His illness seemed to really only last four days. That was the village record. Everyone called it dengue until the TV said the rest of the world was saying there was something called Zika virus going around. So everyone switched to calling it Zika. It made sense to give it a different name anyway. It only felt like dengue, but we all understood dengue as a once in a lifetime deal, so it was probably something else. I don't know exactly what a virus is, and I don't think anybody really does, but I do believe that we all caught something from a mosquito. Bugs can deliver pathogens into our bodies that attack us directly. I will tell another story in the next chapter, but suffice to say I am satisfied with labeling this phenomena a viral infection. The viral infections I'm familiar with mostly do not call for medicine, because few compounds have any reliable effect on the duration or outcome of viral infections. The duration and severity of symptoms seem to depend on only two factors. 
the presence of the infection, and the state of the body dealing with it. A less healthy body will be prone to more infections and will have a harder, longer time dealing with them. Antiviral drugs suppress the immune system. That's what they say they do. I believe this further increases future potential of infections. An older body or a body with an already existing digestive or immune issue will deal with it less easily than a healthier person. I'm fine with calling a bug infection of any kind a disease. Even if the allopathic world doesn't have much to treat it, and neither do we, at least they could provide a safe, clean environment for you to wait out the infection. They could provide you with salt in an IV, one of the most useful things they do, in my opinion. They could get you water and change your sheets and help you out. Grandma's method. We could do that too, but we're generally not equipped. Insurance doesn't pay us, and neither do governments, so it's okay to go to a hospital if you have dengue, as long as you know that your chances are still about the same at home. Does any of this sound like AIDS? We have a pretty good understanding about bacterial, fungal, and even viral infections when they are correlated to an infectious experience like Zika or chickenpox. The way we diagnose AIDS is not by symptoms, like every other thing we have talked about. The way we identify AIDS is to take a PCR test. It looks for markers, and depending on how many you have relative to the spectrum and the arbitrary distinction between HIV and AIDS, you are said to have one or the other. It doesn't matter what symptoms you have before you take the test. The people who were identified for HIV tests were those at high risk of infection. Those infectious risk categories included physical risk in the form of anal sex and chronic risk in the form of drug users and minorities. The groups of people they identified are at a higher risk of infections and chronic illness. These groups have lower life expectancy than others. People who use drugs do compromise their immune system. All drugs compromise the immune system. Fried food compromises the immune system. Cheap processed food compromises the immune system. Stress compromises the immune system. All of this makes people more likely to get sick in many ways. But I'm talking specifically about illnesses. Cold, flu, sinus infections, yeast infections, ear infections, bladder infections, regular sicknesses. This is the experience for unhealthy people. If you look for particularly unhealthy groups, they're pretty easy to find. So we single those people out and say they are most likely to have these markers. And they're also likely to have other markers, such as HSV. They're also likely to get regular sicknesses regularly and have many antibodies in the blood. So we tell these people they have a disease. The treatment for the disease is antiviral drugs. If they survive for any length of time, they are called an HIV or an AIDS patient. If they show improvement for arbitrary time, they can eventually be called in remission. This is as far as the renaming can go. One is always a patient, whether they are in remission or not. Many of the people who were told they had AIDS or HIV, or HSV for that matter, otherwise had no distinct symptoms. They had general symptoms. They had common health problems. My theory would be that the antiviral drugs didn't help any of these people get any healthier. Some of them publicly made lifestyle and nutritional changes and lived healthfully to a normal longevity. Many of them are still alive and I imagine they will continue to do well. Some people didn't do the antiviral drugs. Lots of people did. Many famous people died while on allopathic treatment programs for HIV or AIDS. But even on the deathbed, the symptoms of AIDS are not unique to AIDS. The experience I described for dengue is quite unique. Syphilis is quite unique, with an easily identifiable pathogen. But AIDS patients tend to die of pneumonia. Pneumonia is essentially just final immune system failure. Kaput. It can happen to presidents if they stay out in the rain and catch a fever. I don't think the rain delivers a virus. I think the rain puts that last stress on an under-equipped system and it fails. The micro world is just waiting to devour us as soon as we stop breathing. A coconut drops from the tree and very soon after it is swarming with bugs and fungus and everything is moving in. I think it is the same in our bodies. If we let our internal environment tilt a bit, bad bacteria, fungus, virus, and pathogens of all kinds are given the edge over us. There is a word I have left out of the book so far, alkalinity. This is because there is so much hype behind the word I like to distance myself from it, but let's cover it quickly. Many people report success on helping people achieve a healthy immune system with natural methods. One such category is people with serious immune diagnosis, including AIDS. So, some people have claimed to get good results with AIDS patients via lifestyle changes. If you believe any of the explanations in this book for the pathogenesis of disease, then this makes easy sense. Some practitioners and patients attribute this success to the state of alkalinity. I have some technical disagreements, but as far as described here, I agree with the concept. They say sugar feeds cancer, and sugar promotes acidity, the opposite of alkalinity. As far as I know, the most important factor for whether or not someone is alkaline is whether they have enough calcium. Calcium has many cofactors, and each is important, but none is more important for alkalinity. 
we have one cheap measure of alkalinity and it's very reliable. Putting copper on the skin in the form of a bracelet or a wire will turn the skin underneath green, blue, or black if the person is what we are calling too acidic. If this happens, we say the person is not alkaline. There is a very small window of tolerance in blood pH. Too far in either direction is life-threatening very quickly. I find the copper test very accurate. If I increase the stress on my day without increasing the spread of nutrients and water, then my skin will change color slightly. Most people will turn green quickly, but I will bet that any healthy person will show up green in a few hours if they ate a few full-size bags of potato chips. Calcium, water, and the water-soluble nutrients are the most important factors in reversing this quickly. It is my opinion that the calcium product we promote is the best one in the world. It got me out of lifelong pain, and it keeps my skin clear while wearing copper. If I slack on it a few days, I will turn a bit green with my normal diet. Those water-soluble nutrients include all of the B vitamins and vitamin C. Plants can make these things, and so we get them in food and also in supplement form. The water-soluble nutrients also include minerals called electrolytes. Sodium, potassium, chloride, calcium, magnesium, and phosphorus are water-soluble. Sodium chloride, salt, is water-soluble and arguably the most important nutrient. Ancient soldiers are said to have been paid in salt at various times in history. This is where we get the word salary. This is because you can pillage food all day, but you require salt to digest it. They couldn't cross deserts or mountains without it. Their animals couldn't either. Salt has also been called the most alkalizing substance. Due to technicality, I have to agree. We need enough calcium to be alkaline, but we need salt to absorb it properly. We need salt for the stomach to work properly, and that function is important for all the rest of it. But salt on its own will not make you alkaline. Using enough salt is required for having a healthy, strong stomach acid, which is required for proper absorption of nutrients and digestion of food. If enough of all the essential nutrients are present, the person is alkaline and the body is not in a state of disease. Any person with any disease will likely experience the skin discoloration from copper. I would safely bet on it. Since there is no identifiable link between a pathogen and a state of disease we call AIDS, and since there is no coherent state of disease for AIDS or HIV, I can only assume this thing, sometimes referred to as an autoimmune disease and sometimes referred to as an infection, is neither. I believe the symptoms associated with HIV are symptoms of an unhealthy body, and the people claiming to help people achieve health by encouraging alkalinity, I believe them. The hype about HIV AIDS has decreased in recent years as new diseases come into fashion, but it is still big business, and it is still talked about today much the same way it was 30 years ago. Mainstream medicine still has no better odds with people than they did when they first discovered it. In my business, since I can't treat diseases, I don't. I assume the person has an unhealthy immune system, and I help them figure out how to support a healthy immune system. The other H worth talking about is HPV. HPV is an even weirder case than AIDS and totally deserving a good questioning. This is another H virus that is supposedly caught by skin-to-skin -skin contact or sex. Like HIV, HPV has no specific unique symptoms or experiences. People with HPV markers may develop warts or genital warts and other common symptoms of a depressed immune system. If a woman with these symptoms is pregnant, she can give birth to a child with these symptoms also. The CDC says 90% of HPV infections go away on their own within two years. Very interesting. The weirdest thing about HPV, in my opinion, is the vaccine for it. The reason behind most of the marketing for this is that people with HPV markers are at a higher risk for certain cancers. Given the pathogenesis of cancers and all chronic diseases in this book, this would make general sense, but it would not make sense to vaccinate against it. A vaccine might make sense if it was sure to eliminate the risk of infection, but it does not. To me, it has not been properly demonstrated that any of the H's are infections. I think the blood can develop many antibodies as it is exposed to many things throughout life. The longer we live, the more antibodies we have. If we eat the wrong foods or are deprived of enough of the essential nutrients, we will face many challenges in life. Some of those problems will be physical, mechanical problems. Others will be infectious. Some of those infections will be easily identifiable and treatable. Some will be pernicious, vague, and they can spell the end for the patient. In any case, we know that none of the H's are a death sentence, and all of them have plenty of cases walking around just fine with no symptoms. I don't feel comfortable calling any of the H's a disease, or an infection, and I think this leads us perfectly into our final chapter, covering the latest fashionable disease. Chapter 10. The New Virus A few of the social media accounts I run could be considered conspiracy-oriented. I'm used to being on the outside opinion, but I'm not used to much censorship about it. The only things that I was really directly censored about in the past were things that I considered fake news. Things shown on the news that I thought were fake. Staged. 
directed, like a movie or a TV commercial. For whichever reason, talking about fake news is discouraged on many social media platforms. Since my accounts aren't about news or fake news, this means I can usually say mostly whatever I want. All of the stuff in this book so far I am able to say on the internet or in public without expecting censorship. I have said everything here publicly before and posted it. In 2020, a new virus media event happened and suddenly I saw government links attached to my posts when my posts contained any word associated to the new virus. This now also happens to the word vaccine. I don't normally like to talk much about vaccines. I already know they are a target for censorship and I really don't want my accounts punished in any way. We don't sell or promote anything having to do with vaccines, so it doesn't matter to the core of our message. There are books on the subject that I agree with, and I usually just recommend them and move on. My point here is that these keywords are in fact targeted for censorship. Since I am submitting this book to Amazon, I want to avoid these keywords. So far this book is written in legal terminology that should not get me in trouble, but there are many new laws in place about this new virus that are much more worrisome than any disease we have so far discussed. I will refer to this 2020 event as the beer virus. At this point I want to say that I'm not blaming any particular medical professionals for anything here. Bluntly, they are not educated in nutrition, and so I don't expect them to have a good understanding of most diseases we have covered. They also don't have to be bad people. I've worked in research, and I know that all of us can have great intentions, yet the system can still be bad, and the outcomes can still be bad. There might be more reprehensible, deliberate obfuscations by the media, but even then I don't have the energy to assign personal blame. The media shouldn't be responsible for health information anyway, and neither should governments. I believe there is a lot of deliberate misinformation, combined with a lot of good intentions gone wrong, combined with hysteria, combined with clumsy and controlled politicians who shouldn't be expected to know what to do about a pandemic. None of this would matter that much if it weren't for the consequences of closing down the world for nearly a year at the time of this writing. I hope this all sounds out of date to future readers and that everything did open back up and go back to normal, but I have a feeling that 2020 will be looked back upon as the year it all changed. By the rest of this book, it should be expected by my own logic that doctors should be responsible for handling this so-called pandemic. If it is an infection, which they say it is, and it has clear specific symptoms and experience, which they say it does, then it should be handled by professionals equipped to handle infectious disease. But what if there is no disease? I have gone to great lengths in this book to avoid using numbers, charts, studies, and unnecessarily technical language. Though the beer disease is arguably the most important event of our time, I still think we can make the argument for it being a fake without even using the exact numbers. I'd like to give my opinion on this starting from the beginning. In late 2019, I was on the road. In Arizona, staying with a friend, the day before I was about to leave, I did not feel good. I was coming down with something, for sure. I had been on the road for several months, and this was not the first sign that my body had had enough. I had been tired and hungry recently. My skin was showing blemishes and my lips were swollen, and now, for the first time in years, I was getting sick. This was embarrassing because I am in the health business. I hadn't been sick like this since I started the program, but I knew I was to blame. Planes and cars are both heavy EMF and can generally be exhausting. Staying with many different people all the time and shuffling from place to place is stressful. Eating can be a problem on the road, because I avoid common ingredients like gluten and oil, and so I also tend to eat very little on the road. I also tend to drink more than normal coffee, which dehydrates. Normally I am not very hungry, but after a while of this I can develop a serious craving. In America recently, a few gluten-free cookie brands have also begun making no oil options. They're still not good. Sugar and processed carbs generally is still not good. But I was so hungry. I ate a bunch of them over probably a week, and at the end of the week, I got sick. I'm confessing this for a few reasons. First, it shows that an otherwise healthy person can tilt that balance pretty easily. Second, it puts me in doubt that this viral experience I had was caught. I don't think I got it from the cookies. I think I will get sick more likely if I treat my body poorly. This definitely was not a foodborne illness. Anyone who has gotten a food poisoning knows that it is a very unique experience. There were none of the digestive symptoms. My primary symptom was a miserable restlessness and lack of energy closer to dengue than to a bacterial infection. The third reason to confess this is because this was Christmas Eve and the latest disease being promoted was the beer virus. I had been using international airports and shaking hands and touching gas pumps and I was at a high risk of picking up any bug with this lifestyle. I spent Christmas Day in a hotel in miserable restlessness. I spent as long as I could under the hot water in the shower. I drank lots of salty water and regular water. I doubled my supplements. I waited it out. 
I didn't eat anything because there is nothing good available at an airport hotel, especially on Christmas Day. The next day I was well enough to travel to a friend's house and sit with her in miserable restlessness. A few more groggy days and on New Year's Eve I was just about normal and on the way back home. Since we are in the health business and our primary form of sales takes place in the form of answering questions from the public, we can expect questions about new diseases as they hit the news. Like vaccines, infectious diseases are not a topic I try to cover. We are not claiming to be emergency caregivers. We promote nutritional strategies for gradual and long-term health improvements, mostly. We have to talk a lot about food and salt and other things because it matters directly to our sales proposition. We are proposing that they will feel better if they take our products, and we must insist that food matters in that equation. The beer disease doesn't have anything to do with our business, and it is being targeted for censorship, so naturally I want to avoid the subject. But it kept coming up. People wanted to know what to do. We had the same answer to offer that we always do. Support and promote the body's natural ability to maintain and repair itself. It was never very exciting, but people everywhere were excited about the beer virus. I think this answer was in line with what we can legally say. The news says there is a new flu out there, which is an immune problem. There are several things that are widely recognized as supporting and promoting a healthy immune system. Several of these indisputable compounds are also essential nutrients. Nutrients are deemed essential if we get a disease without them. Since the beginning of the new virus, there was a flurry of activity around long-known nutrients like zinc, vitamin C, vitamin E, vitamin D, and so on. These are essential nutrients and have always been a part of our pitch, so we didn't need to change this. Our recommendation remained the same. Support the body by avoiding the bad stuff and taking all the essential nutrients in intelligent amounts. If attempting to further support the immune system, increase the specific nutrients that are known to do this. They are called antioxidant nutrients. Increasing all the water-soluble nutrients is not a bad idea either. A lot of people expected us to jump on this pandemic as a way to market these specific nutrients more heavily, but we have never recommended just taking one or a few nutrients. We have always recommended taking all of them and boosting some as needed. I didn't change my habits in response to the growing concern. I didn't buy hand sanitizer. I only use hand sanitizer if we were out in the bush without running water. Otherwise, I wash my hands and that's all. Early in 2020, we were in Michigan with my mentor, Dr. Joel Wallach. He's a veterinarian, a comparative pathologist, and a naturopathic human physician. I figure he knows more about these beer viruses than I do. Every time I see him, I try to have a few questions. As the years have gone on, I have had less questions. I think this is because I believe myself to understand most of the topics that come up. This is good. But in the nutrition business, we are not supposed to be experts on viruses. Surgeries and infections can be very complicated. It's something people go to school for. It's professional territory requiring licenses and qualifications that I don't have. Dr. Wallach has those credentials, so I asked him. He gave me the same answer that he gave the audience that evening. He said that beer viruses are common. They are a type of flu. The flu kills many people each year. Some years they have different names, but it's more or less the same thing. At this time, the talk on the TV was mostly still about China and Europe. The TV and others say that this beer is different from the beers of history. This one is especially potent, they say. In the early months, I saw a lot of footage of people in China falling over in the street from this virus. I am not familiar with any virus that strikes a person so violently. There were also many people laying down, apparently dead, in the street. It looked apocalyptic, and it looked very strange. I have seen at least one virus hit an entire small population hard. Everyone went to bed. They did not go out on the streets to lay down on a staircase. It was very strange. This type of behavior could be caused by two things, in my opinion. The first is some sort of radiation stun. There are frequency-based stun technologies. Crowd control. I assume these could be made strong enough to kill a person. But from the footage I have seen, it is not clear if any of the people laying down are dead. Many of them break their own fall as they are falling, which looks like acting. And many move while on the ground. There are lots of videos showing this. I know these are very strong claims, and so I made a full-length video about it. The video was taken down from YouTube and blocked from BitChute. I managed to get one version of it onto my Instagram account, at Transcend Towers, but then I decided to make an extended version and put it on its own website. It is probably worth writing a book on the subject, but it was well suited to a video. The video can be viewed on www.wagthedogtheory.com. I recommend downloading it if it is still up when you check. I could have included hours of the people falling down, but there is much more relevant content to make the case in the video. On the video, I attempted to establish that the media has a history of participating in or falling for fake news stories. 
In the 1997 movie Wag the Dog, the main characters in the film stage a short clip about a war with Albania to avoid a sex scandal with the president. It is an entertaining and instructive watch. I believe this concept has given us many incidents to talk about, including the 2020 event. My strongest reason for saying this, apart from the many strange things in Western media, is this Chinese falling down dead phenomena. It appears as if these people were either being stunned or that some of them were acting. This behavior was not seen anywhere else in the world. If they had a virus that was dropping people like that, why did it not look like that anywhere else? Was it a different virus? Was it a virus at all? My wife suggested that I remove these paragraphs from the book. She said the rest of the book doesn't sound like a conspiracy, but this does. She has seen our platforms punished for talking about the beer virus in general, and she knows that I have very little to gain by covering this topic. She is right. The point of this book has nothing to do with this pandemic and the pandemic has nothing to do with our business. We help people understand and overcome common chronic problems. We don't do pandemics. It's not in our job description or training. But the pandemic has changed our world, and I care quite a lot about that. I'm compelled to offer some kind of theory to explain the people falling down in China. There has been very little commentary offered about it from either the mainstream or the alternative world. It seems most people forgot about this happening, or they never saw the footage. It was only shown briefly before the script moved on. I saved hours of this footage and I have watched it deeply and it still does not make sense. There has not been any other virus promoted using this type of footage that I am aware of. I have lived through many viral scares so far, including SARS, bird flu, Ebola, Zika, mad cow disease, etc. I cannot recall ever seeing footage of anyone falling down from any virus anywhere in the world. Hollywood movies really don't even look like that. When hit with a virus, people tend to slow down dramatically, but they don't tend to just drop on the streets. That's what weapons do. Since there is nothing to compare the footage to, I have to come up with something. And since no one that I am aware of has really talked deeply about this footage, I don't have any other theories to reference. Lots of people blamed this phenomenon on 5G cell phone towers being turned on. I thought I was being reasonable to assume this was not the case. In the footage, there are only select people falling over. It is not whole crowds. It does not look to me like a tranquilizer, and there is no evidence of that as far as I can tell. It does not look like poisoning. There are no bodily fluids or other signs of poisoning. There is also no clear evidence that any of the people falling over or laying down are dead. There is clear evidence in most of the videos that most of the people on the ground are moving by themselves, so they are alive. In most of the video, none of these people are coughing or communicating at all. They could be stunned or they could be acting, and I honestly have no other theories. Maybe they were drugged, but it just doesn't look like that. This is important evidence that was used to implement the most serious disease protocol ever seen on earth by anyone alive. Then this evidence disappeared from all conversation except the hardcore conspiracy theorists who still say that 5G must be responsible. I would be fine calling the beer virus the thing responsible for the people falling down, but I would have questions about the rest of the world. China seems to be doing fine at the moment without people falling down in the streets. People didn't fall down anywhere else. Videos are better than numbers in some cases, but the numbers for the beer virus have been questionable from the start. The disappearance of deaths from chronic diseases like heart attack and cancer, the disappearance of the regular flu that tends to kill around 250,000 to 500,000 people a year according to the World Health Organization, the difference between dying with and dying from, important questions and distinctions that have really been left out of the conversation. We are used to seeing the types of symptoms that have been reported in the West. Flu-like symptoms, respiratory infection type symptoms. We alternative people don't have ventilators to offer, and quite honestly I didn't even understand the use of one. At the beginning of the event I misspoke on podcasts, calling them respirators. We don't use them, so I didn't know. But I didn't see how they could be helpful. The story behind the ventilators is that the human body doesn't like having a tube jammed down the throat. We tend to have to give serious drugs to a person to get them into a state where they can receive such treatment. One of these drugs is fentanyl, which by mainstream accounts kills many people on its own. To me, this sounds terrible. Why someone with an infection would want to go through this is beyond me. I would rather go to a sauna. The numbers they report as success with these machines are terrible. On my end of the Q&A world, every person who has reported to me that someone died of the beer virus said they were on a ventilator. All of them. Many people reported that they were tested positive or they developed something like the news was describing, a respiratory flu. They got better. No one who died, reported to me, did so at home. They were all on a ventilator. But this was really the main treatment offered by the allopathic profession. 
it seems sloppy to me. Even as numbers rise on the television, I haven't seen or heard of anything that looks like something other than a flu. I haven't seen or heard of anything like Chinese people falling over in the streets. Chinese people in western cities did not fall down in the streets. Many people have gotten sick. Many people get sick every year. If the period we are measuring is now a year, the chances are very good that many people would have gotten sick of something like this in this time frame. I don't know what the beer virus really is. From what I can tell, there is a flu present. Maybe 2020 was a worse year than normal, like 2018. A relatively bad year for flu viruses. I can't tell if it was a bad year because the numbers don't make sense. Other deaths from chronic diseases don't just disappear, and neither does the regular flu if there's a new one that year. I also don't trust PCR tests, and I never did. The guy who invented them said you could use the test to find whatever you want. I believe him. What I do know is that I have never experienced this type of totalitarianism in response to a crisis. I am tempted to pause for a tirade about my personal inconveniences during the closures and lockdowns, but I have complained loudly elsewhere. My life has been interfered with in ways I have never experienced from governments before. I have never seen economies forced to shut. The legal entitlement of a disease falls under the jurisdiction of licensed medical professionals. One consequence of this entitlement is that this profession is licensed to deliver medicines and other treatments in response to disease. The 2020 event is called a disease, therefore, this is the jurisdiction of the medical profession. Though I have many problems with the classification of disease, I do not have a problem with this legal entitlement, when appropriate. One benefit of licensing the care of practitioners is that politicians cannot legally deliver medicine or give medical advice. My primary contention with chemical fluoride added to public water supplies is not that it is harmful. It could be beneficial. I don't care. It requires proof to demonstrate an effect either way, and I don't want to deal with proof. We can handle such questions with logic. Fluoride is added in the water not for purification purposes. Chlorine is added to water for purification purposes. I have a separate problem with that, but for another day. Fluoride is added into public water supplies for a medical purpose. The medical purpose is to prevent tooth decay. That's the reason they give for adding the stuff. But since this is a medical purpose, by law, this is a jurisdiction of medical professionals. This is a medicine to treat a health problem, tooth decay. Doctors are supposed to be the only profession licensed to prescribe medication for health problems. People in this system retain the choice of which medicines to put in their body. They don't have to fulfill the prescription or take the advice. Politicians are not doctors and should not be allowed to prescribe medication to anyone, let alone entire populations. In my profession, I'm expected to give some kind of disclaimer that my advice is not legally acceptable medical advice, and I expect media and politicians to adhere to the same guidelines. My problem with fluoride is political. I don't care if doctors think it will help my teeth or not. I don't feel the need to use it, and I care about my choice to make that decision. Doctors are there as an option. I can go and see my doctor and ask his advice. I can choose whether or not to take his advice. My problem with the new disease is also political. I don't really care what viruses are floating around this year or next. I am prepared to face the world to the best of my ability. I would like to use dramatic words to express my disappointment in my home country, Canada, essentially devastating its own way of life. But to be brief, I don't think business as usual will continue anytime soon. I think unreasonable measures against an invisible threat will continue and may increase. I want to hope that borders reopen and that sanity restores, but I am not willing to bet on it. There will always be pathogens around. We will always need to support and promote a healthy body and immune system. Chances are we will get sick a few times in life. None of this is new, but the world has changed dramatically because of what I believe to be a fake disease, and my biggest concerns about it are all political. Doctors don't even seem to have much to do with this mess. The frustration felt by the people and the draconian measures imposed are from politicians, not doctors. This shouldn't be happening because these are medically based decisions. That is kind of the best I can do on this subject without detailed analysis. If this is a real virus, I think the response to it is much worse than the infection. Others have said that the cure should not be worse than the disease, and I agree. Chapter 11. What is disease, really? Many years ago, I arrived late one night at my friend's apartment. He wasn't there, but he knew I was coming. I had been staying there throughout the summer. We had badly neglected the lawn that summer. The grass was long and full of bugs and other creatures. The door was locked, but the basement window in the back was not locked. I crawled into the house and I brought fleas from the long grass in with me. I know this happened because I was just there and there were no fleas. I was tired and I slept on the couch with my clothes on, and I woke up covered in fleas. I also woke up in another mental dimension. Something was amazingly wrong, psychedelically wrong. Everything was wrong. 
I didn't know where or who I was for a moment. The room was kaleidoscopic and I did not feel good at all. I made it to the bathroom. The 10 foot distance felt like it took a while, but I didn't trust my perception of time. I felt drunk but also very sick. In the mirror, I was pale as ever and I was bleeding from my nose. My eyes were bloody red as well. I used the toilet and there was a lot of blood. None of this had ever happened to me. I was delirious and it felt hard to even think about what was going on. I called my mother. She is a school teacher and she happened to work right across the street from my friend's house. I told her I needed her help and I dragged myself over to her office. I had a feeling I didn't need to go to the hospital. I figured I needed antibiotics and fast. She took me to our family doctor. He agreed, wrote up a prescription for antibiotics and I picked them up downstairs. I took the drugs and I began to feel better quite quickly. I really was worried for a moment. I had never been bleeding from everywhere before. I felt like I was going to die. And I believe to this day that conventional medical treatment saved my life that day. I stayed with my mother for a few weeks. In that time, I rested a lot. I watched a lot of TV on the couch with blankets and hot beverages and soups. And that's pretty much it. Modern grandma's recipe. I don't have anything personal against my doctor. There is a certain hostility that can be found in the alternative world for the failures of the modern medical professions. A certain indignation. Righteous indignation. Many people who have found alternative paths to health carry an underlying outrage that their conventional doctors failed to help them. I was born with health problems and I grew up with pains in many forms. My doctor could have known about the nutritional strategies that eventually did get me out of pain. When I did eventually find the right doses of the right stuff I needed, the pain I had been living with for 25 years disappeared in less than a week. I am, deep down, upset that I missed so many healthful years. I could have thrived in my youth, but I was held back by chronic pain. It is unfortunate that my doctor and his profession is not required to learn about nutrition because it was nutrition that cured my symptoms. But it's not his fault. It's a shame. My mother also didn't know that her nutrition would cause problems in me. Also not her fault. Also unfortunate. And it is unfortunate that my pain and most of the pain we deal with in the public was preventable and reversible long ago. When I caught that bug from that flea, it was pretty clear what had happened. When I tell the story, I don't refer to the incident as a disease. I caught a particularly horrible bug. My doctors gave me a few potential disease names for the pains and problems I experienced growing up. The names never seemed to matter because the explanations were vague and unsatisfying and the treatments offered were usually harmful. I didn't like pharmaceutical drugs and they didn't seem to help my pains anyway. I got better results with over-the-counter pain creams than a lifetime of searching for answers from my regular doctor, and then I was completely relieved of the main problems that had bothered me a lifetime in under a week. Hopefully having said all of this, you can see my point of view about the nature of disease. So, what is a disease? Aside from the legal aspect of the word, a disease is a belief. In some cases, such as syphilis, we can easily identify a pathogenic cause. It is sensible to believe in bugs because they can get us, and we need to act when that happens. But everything else we have talked about is a name for a cluster of symptoms. Symptoms are all the result of unhealthy bodies. Various things can contribute to stresses, and various things can defend against them. It doesn't seem useful to think of these things as diseases. Sometimes we are presented with a new disease, and I think we ought to ask serious questions about these new diseases. I think we should retain the legal rights to support our body the way we choose, and take the medical advice we choose. I do not think governments should be empowered to make health decisions for individuals or groups. For the common health challenges that face so many people in my country and others, I encourage a shift in the way we think about disease. Identifying as a diseased patient, or having a disease that is not transmitted, is not correct or helpful. Thinking about most diseases as something we catch rather than something we encourage or discourage does not help us understand the nature, development, prevention, or reversal of the symptoms. It does not lead us to better treatment. It leads us further into the mess of the medical establishment. No one should be on long-term medication for health problems that are preventable or reversible, and none of us should fear diseases that don't exist. I think we should stop using the word disease. If we catch an infection, we can simply refer to it as an infection, and we should all be able to understand. If our body is failing us or falling apart, there is no practical value in calling this process a disease. Dis-ease, a lack of ease, once well but not now, this might have been what the word once meant. Now it means anything the medical industry wants research and treatment money for. Dis-ease isn't cured with medical treatment, and it never will be. The absolute best that medical treatment can do is ease or relieve symptoms, often at the cost of another function in the body. The medical industry has a terrible track record even for this. Our alternative industry exists because so many people fail to find relief from the mainstream professions. 
We do not need to put common health problems and degeneration in the care of licensed professionals. We can take care of ourselves and live a long, healthful life. Acknowledgements. All of the core information in this book derives from Dr. Joel Wallach's work. I credit him with my health because his products got me out of pain and his protocols have allowed me to optimize and thrive. On top of the nutritional information, Dr. Wallach is a leader in this field of personal health and he is the reason I am on this mission too. There are few people on earth deserving the level of respect I have for him and I will promote this message in his name as long as I am able. My time with him not only taught me the protocols but how to handle questions from the public. Dr. Wallach has many books and lectures published and I recommend all of them. I started an Instagram account in his name, at Wallach's Warriors, and a team of us handle questions in that inbox. This is the easiest way for you to contact us. We also have a YouTube account, Wallach's Warriors, where we post full lectures and also personal development, sales, and business content for our distributors. We also have a Facebook page, at Wallach's Warriors. We can be reached by phone, toll-free in the USA, one 888 Two one one two five four nine. I must also acknowledge pharmacist Ben Fuchs as a core inspiration for the delivery of this message. He really helped me understand the human application of Dr. Wallach's message, and his generosity and support has been key to my growth in this field. I stole many key phrases and explanations in this book from him, particularly the noun-verb distinction of disease. Ben produces a lot of content, and it can be found on www.pharmacistben.com. Another person I've borrowed heavily from is Dr. Peter Glidden. Dr. Glidden has done perhaps more than anyone in really breaking down the message. In the early days, we would meet someone with a health problem, then go home and watch a Dr. Glidden webinar on that problem. Not only does Dr. Glidden go into great detail on what causes diseases, he explains what works and what doesn't and why. More importantly, he explains how and why to talk about these things legally. All of my understanding about the legal importance of disease, treatment, and cure come from Dr. Glidden's teaching. Dr. Glidden has a YouTube channel, Glidden Healthcare, and you can find more about him on www.glidden.healthcare. Dr. Glidden has two books, The MD Emperor Wears No Clothes and Attempt to Cure with Holistic Medicine. I'm not sure if I can name our company next to the specific claims I've made in this book, but I will acknowledge what I think of as the family business. I've met so many amazing people in this business, and many of them have given me their time, advice, books, and other forms of support. I cannot name all of them and I cannot properly express my gratitude to everyone who has helped me in this journey. Lastly, outside of our company, I have found warmth and support in the alternative health world as well. Many big names in the business carry a respect for Dr. Wallach and my association with him has granted me access to some people you would normally have to wait in line to meet. Many great people promote many different pathways to health in this field and I don't find that much competition. Most of us have our own turf and even competing products generally share a respect for other companies. I have become friends with several people in other companies and have learned a lot from them. We all share common goals of promoting good health information. I'm proud to work in this field and in this company. I don't know where I would be without this information, and I hope it has helped any reader reach a better understanding. At Wallach's Warriors is our main Instagram account. We regularly answer live audience questions and we will answer every message in the inbox. Our food Instagram account at Notice Foods teaches how to make practically every dish you could think of without the bad foods listed. We have talented cooks and bakers who will take requests and answer questions. We also have a YouTube channel, Notice Foods, to teach cooking according to our guidelines. At Ryan Alexander is my personal Instagram account and I post mostly book reviews. My personal YouTube channel is The Real Notice, where I post mostly my opinion. I also have a podcast, Notice and Friends. At Transcend Towers is my cell phone tower Instagram account, as well as miscellaneous conspiracy material. At The Real Notice is my art Instagram account. Behind everything else, I was always supposed to be an artist. I have more help in the business these days, and I have been devoting more and more time to art. I also have a YouTube channel, Notice Art, teaching art on a budget. I have art for sale at www.noticeart.com. I also have a book of my life's worth of drawings available on Amazon. I have published a book in defense of Dr. Wallach in response to his critics. I have also published a collection of awakening stories that I gathered from my audience and friends. Our products can be found at www.wallachswarriors.ca. We encourage you to contact us for help figuring out what might be best for you. As well as any of the accounts above, you can email us at ygyontario@gmail.com. at gmail.com.